Okay, Sergeant, will you begin your recordings, please? PC recording is underway. Recording to the cloud is up. Sergeant Polite, can we begin with your opening statement? Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to the remote hearing on preliminary budget on public, public housing. Will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Once again, will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place all cell phones and electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair, we are ready to begin. Good afternoon, and thank you all for attending today's hearing on the New York City Housing Authority's fiscal 2022 preliminary budget and five-year operating and capital plans for 2021 to 2025. I am council member Alika Ampre Samuel, and I am the chair of the council's committee on public housing. I would like to acknowledge that I am joined today by council member Ayala, council member Diaz Sr. and council member Rosenthal. Exactly one year ago today, the Council's Committee on Public Housing held its budget hearing on the fiscal 2021 budget in person at City Hall. And it was the very last budget hearing to be held at City Hall as the city began to shut down less than 48 hours later. In fact, I wasn't even present for the hearing. My colleague, Council Member Vanessa Gibson chaired on my behalf. My son was exposed and we were in precautionary isolation at the time. It's hard to believe how much has changed since last March and how much the COVID-19 pandemic has upended our personal lives, normal routines and finances. Even more concerning is that these impacts have not been felt equally citywide. Certain communities and neighborhoods are struggling now more than ever. Across NYCHA developments from March through May of last year, an estimated 1,200 residents passed away due to complications from confirmed and probable cases related to COVID, and an estimated 7,800 residents tested positive for COVID. These figures only provide a snapshot of the beginning months of the pandemic and are likely much larger. On top of these health-related concerns, during this past year, an estimated 36,000 NYCHA households have submitted interim recertification requests citing rent hardship and the need to lower their monthly rent payments. The road to post-COVID recovery is long and we must use every tool at our disposal to ensure that residents struggling to pay rent are not further crushed by this pandemic. It appears that the tide may be turning soon though, and that some much needed relief is on the way. In January, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced the opening of three vaccination clinics in NYCHA developments, providing on-site vaccinations for residents 65 and older. In addition, the state opened five sites for eligible NYCHA residents to also receive vaccinations. Last year, the CARES Act, commonly referred as the First Stimulus Act, provided some much needed federal operating support for NYCHA's public housing and Section 8 programs, and the American Recovery Act of 2021 signed by President Biden yesterday will hopefully or could offer some much needed resources and funding support for NYCHA's ongoing recovery efforts by way of vouchers. Yesterday's bill will provide a much needed infusion of $6 billion to New York City, but it doesn't necessarily address 
the critical needs of NYCHA at this very moment. Last month, I had the opportunity to meet with Senate Majority Leader Charles Schumer, and he informed me that the second reconciliation process will directly address infrastructure. And we are actively working with the Majority Leader's office on the needs of NYCHA residents and to ensure that NYCHA is at the forefront of everyone's mind. Additionally, we have a new Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, the Honorable Secretary Marsha Fudge. Prior to her time in Congress, Ms. Fudge was a mayor and she is no stranger to budgetary constraints, racism, the affordability crisis in major cities, homelessness, and the dangers of projecting false impressions over driving meaningful policy. While we anticipate great things to come from our government partners, NYCHA cannot solely rely on its government partners to provide a plan to move forward. In July of 2020, they announced the Blueprint for Change Plan and outlined a set of ideas and strategies to reorganize the authority and secure the capital financing required to stabilize and improve physical conditions across their entire portfolio. This is the first ever comprehensive plan for every property and every building in NYCHA's portfolio. But residents continue to have considerable hesitation. While the Blueprint for Change is plan is bold and comprehensive, it still relies on funding resources available at the federal level and requires state action and approval. Prior administrations have introduced answers and plans that were never seen through to completion. Residents are not interested in the blueprint while they still have unanswered questions and incomplete projects from the previous plans in the previous administrations. At today's hearing, we hope to gain a clearer sense of how NYCHA's five-year adopted operation, operating and capital plans for 2021 to 2025 address the very needs and challenges currently confronting the authority. We are also eager to learn about NYCHA's compliance with the pillars outlined in the HUD administrative agreement with respect to the remediation of lead paint hazards, mold, pest infestations, inspections, heating, and elevators. At the city level, the administration has allocated $3 billion in city capital funds in fiscal years 2021 to 2025 for roofs, heating systems, and other critical building system improvements across the pillar areas of the administrative agreement. And at the state level, another 450 million is expected to supplement this work. But most importantly, I look forward to hearing from NYCHA about how all of this translates to improved services and the quality of life for its residents. So with that being said, I'll end my opening statement. And after NYCHA, we will hear from members of the public. I will now turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedural items. Thank you. I am Audrey Sun, counsel to the Committee on Public Housing before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. Please be aware that there may be a delay in muting and unmuting. I will call on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I announce. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will limit council member questions to five minutes. We will now hear from the New York City Housing Authority, which is represented by Gregory Russ, Chair and CEO, Vito Mustachulo, General Manager and Chief Operating Officer, Anika Lescott, Executive Vice President of Finance and Chief Financial Officer, and Stephen Lovesey, Executive Vice President of Capital Projects. I will now administer the oath. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Gregory Russ? I do. Vito Mustachulo? 
I do. Anika Lescott? I do. And Stephen Lovesey? I do. Thank you. You may begin when ready. Um, wait, one quick second before you get started. I also want to recognize Council Member Jonai, Council Member Menchaca, and Council Member Van Bramer, who have also joined with us. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, it's uh, very good to see all of you. And uh, Chair, I do remember that hearing very well. Uh, and I look forward to a time, I hope this year, when we're back in the room together and able to, to talk over uh, our issues and mutual concerns. So, so Chair Alika Amper Samuel, members of the Committee on Public Housing, other distinguished members of the City Council, NYCHA residents, members of the public, good afternoon. My name is Greg Russ. I am NYCHA's chair and CEO. I'm pleased to be joined by the general manager and chief operating officer, Vito Mastachulo, executive vice president of finance and CFO, uh, Nika Lescott, and our executive vice president of capital projects, Steve Lovesey, and other members of the NYCHA team. Thank you for the opportunity to present the authority's adopted budget, which was approved by the board of directors in December of 2020, and to discuss our mission to transform this agency and our residents' homes. It has been a year of unprecedented adversity for our city, our nation, and the world, and our budget reflects uh, the difficulties that we face. Although we are changing the structure of NYCHA, uh, we're compelled to change the structure of NYCHA, our aging and deteriorating structures also need to change, and as yet, the funding simply isn't there to do that. Despite these challenges, we are making some progress with critical work to improve the way NYCHA operates and to bring our buildings the investment that they desperately need. We need top to bottom renovations, however, and that follows through on a number of our initiatives, including uh, efforts through Pact and RAD and proposed initiatives under the blueprint. Before I go into details about the 2021 budget, I'd like to talk a little bit about COVID and how that has impacted all New Yorkers, including NYCHA. NYCHA has been following the guidance from federal, state, and local experts to ensure that our policies and procedures are thorough and responsive and aligned to that advice. This includes health and safety measures and protective gear for staff, significant adjustments to work order guidance, increased communications and outreach efforts, and the simplification of the rent hardship process. The chair mentioned this in her opening remarks, and we're very happy to have been able to provide this. The hardship policy is a powerful safety valve for families who lost work or income due to COVID and is a core feature of stabilizing the families and NYCHA for that matter. That's because the rent for public housing will be 30% of adjusted income and can be adjusted during the year for the very things that happened during the COVID pandemic. As of the end of February, NYCHA estimates that we've decreased rent for approximately 51,000 families in public housing and another 4,400 in the Section 8 program. This does result, however, in a decrease of revenue for the agency, about 89 million last year, 66 million of which we estimate is attributable to the COVID-19 impact. It should be noted that rent revenue is about a third of our budget and large reductions mean significantly less money to repair and preserve our buildings. At the same time, the coronavirus had significant impact on our expenses. We saw an increase of around $88 million uh, for all kinds of things, protective gear, equipment, sanitation. So that's a swing of approximately 154 million when we take those two things together. I'll come back to this and we'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, ways that has impact us, impacted the agency. In addition to dealing with COVID, we continued to move forward with the HUD agreement requirements and the authority's transformation plan. And both of these make additional demands on NYCHA. These are major undertakings and they drive the work that we are doing to improve our organization. The delivery of services and the compliance required under that document impacts directly the quality of life, but they are costly and they come with additional or dedicate, without additional or dedicated federal funding. HUD and the Southern District formally concurred with our transformation plan this past Monday, March 8th. The plan envisions a potential uh, organizational and operational changes to improve customer service and responsiveness to conditions at the property. 
and ensure that large projects are completed in a timely manner, promoting accountability at the property level and creating metrics to make that accountability measurable. Its initiatives will enable us to manage our properties better and use the funding we have to improve the quality of life for our residents. It is vital to the success of this plan that we invest in this institutional change. The 2021 budget focused on these values and included key additions to properties, including additional skilled trades and support for what we're calling the neighborhood model, which is NYCHA's effort to create smaller property management portfolios and bring more decision-making and resources to the developments. In addition, there'll be other business process changes, such as a streamlined annual review process for residents. The 2021 budget includes approximately $19 million to support this transition. The transformation plan is based on ideas and feedback that we've received from residents and staff through virtual town halls, emails, social media, phone calls, and other engagement sessions that took place through 2019 and 2020. And in addition, the plan was made public for pub available for public comment in the month of December. We will continue to engage our stakeholders and partners to incorporate feedback as we bring the plan strategies to life. The next steps for us include an implementation period and development of specific implementation steps. We hope to have part one of that done by September 2021 20, and part two by June of 22. The implementation plans will guide the NYCHA restructuring and be, bring a more responsive and effective organization. Some of the operational improvements that are already underway include a shift to the neighborhood model. The plan also includes ideas for streamlining NYCHA's management structure, looking at improving and revising the alternative work schedules, improving productivity through technology, enhancing resident partnerships and expanding resident opportunities, and empowering employees through learning and development. While we transform our organization, we also need to transform our buildings into acceptable and improved conditions. Our decades old buildings are in a very deteriorated condition. In fact, they need approximately $40 billion to bring them to a state of good repair. This is an overwhelming figure. It's enormous in fact, and it increases at the rate of about a billion dollars a year. As part of the transformation plan, for example, we took a look at if the buildings were not repaired, how much staff would we need to just try and stay even? We've estimated we would have to hire an additional 2,800 staff at an annual cost of $200 million to address work orders associated with the, some of these conditions and driven by things like failing building systems. It would be impossible to keep up with the demand of our aging deteriorating buildings at the current funding levels for operations. Capital needs are chewing through the federal, state, and city funding. These sources combined at present levels can never meet the needs. If we think about NYCHA's total need, it is 20 times the total national appropriation from Congress. So for example, for each apartment per month, we receive an average of $538 in tenant rent, $513 in operating subsidy, and with support from the city, about $129 per unit per month, about $1,181 in total. But that apartment costs us $1,423 to operate. That's a deficit of $242 per apartment per month, roughly 46 million across the entire portfolio. In order to balance our budget, we have to move money across our funds to support the operation and the demands that the buildings are place, placing on the operating budget. In addition to spending more than we receive for basic operation and maintenance, we are also committed, committing large amounts of scarce funding to attack the major issues that result from our old buildings. And uh, we continue to uh, address compliance as a result of that. Since 2018, we have increased our annual operating budget by 121 million to address low lead, mold, heat, elevators, pests and waste, and HUD inspections. These are part of our obligations under the HUD agreement. To meet the demands of the buildings, we've hired additional staff. And of course that comes with additional costs. There's approximately a, a, the allocation of about 1500 employees in the 2021 budget for the areas that I mentioned. And this compares to about a thousand in 2018. 
Overall, we're allocating more funds to combat these issues than we did just a few years ago. For example, about 44 million in, for instance, to address lead compared to about 12 million in 2018. 16 million on mold compared to zero in 2018 and 36 million on pests and waste versus 3 million in 2018. These expenses have yielded some progress. We've created a waste management department and are training approximately 720 staff on integrated pest management approaches. We've completed about 91,000 visual lead paint assessments and more than 62,000 XRF apartment inspections, over 30,000 remediations of paint deficiencies and more than 1,300 apartment abatements. I wanna pause for a minute just to point out how important this XRF apartment inspection testing is. When we are finished, we will have done 134,000 units and we will have identified more clearly than in NYCHA's history where the lead is, what the lead elements are in these apartments. So it's gonna be very important both for compliance under the HUD agreement and for capital planning. We're also launching mold and leak prioritization initiatives and we've been installing roof fans, over 2,200 roof fans at 76 developments. We're resolving a 98% of elevator no service conditions within 18 hours, and we're restoring heat outages faster, about 7.3 hours this year compared to 7.5 hours last year, exceeding the 12 hour requirement. And we're decreasing outages by about 34% over that same period of time. I must stress, however, that mold lead elevator heating system failures are capital issues. They're symptomatics of buildings that have not received required investment. And if we don't bring the buildings this kind of investment through PACT or Blueprint or other means, these issues will continue to plague us. We expect to spend substantially over the next several years to continue to address all the major areas of the HUD agreement. For example, we expect that it will cost a minimum of 1.1 billion to abate the lead paint across the portfolio. I mentioned the XRF testing, that's gonna cost around 101 million to reach those 134,000 apartments. We estimate that the interim control protocols around lead cost around $230 million annually. These are necessary expenditures and a top priority. But as I mentioned, we're not receiving additional federal funding for this work. We are incredibly grateful for the city's investment of at least 2.2 billion over the next decade as part of the HUD agreement. And we've also signed our agreement for the state funds, the 450 million to help replace elevators, upgrade heating systems at our developments. I've described the true cost of doing business and it's not sustainable uh, for our bottom line or for our residents. Again, what we need to do, what we must do is bring our residents the home they deserve by creating the capital to invest in, in, in our properties. So, Let's take a look at the budget outlook. Our budget outlook stresses the need to take creative approaches to ensure the longevity of public housing in New York. We have uh, large numbers and tough numbers. We have 4.06 billion in operating revenues and about 4.08 billion operating expenses projected for 2021. We anticipated a small deficit of around 25 million and we're very hopeful that we'll be able to close this gap as the federal funding picture becomes clearer through this year. NYCHA receives two thirds of its operating revenues from federal sources. This year, we expect to receive 985 million in federal operating subsidy, 601 million in uh, federal capital funds, approximately $9,900 per apartment annually. The 2021 budget assumes a proration factor of 97%. Let me explain what that means because this is one aspect of public housing that's important to realize. Each year, there's a formula that produces the annual subsidy number for the entire country. Congress never or often does not appropriate to the number that the formula produces. So our estimate this year is we're gonna get 97 cents on the dollar. For NYCHA, that's 30 million less than what we are eligible for. We also expect to receive about 248 million in city operating funds. We expect to collect about a billion dollars in rent, though the numbers around rent are declining in general. In 2020, we collected 977 million. That's 89 million less than what we collected in 2019. 
Part of that, in fact, was due to COVID. We expect to receive about 1.3 billion for Section 8 vouchers and associated administrative fees. The Section 8 program is well managed, designated by HUD as a high performer, despite the fact that we are underfunded by HUD's formula. This means that we have a contract with HUD for 104,000 vouchers, but under the current funding uh, protocols, we receive money for 86,000. That's roughly 83% of the 104,000 vouchers we're eligible for. And we continue to press Congress to fund the voucher program in full. The 4.08 billion in operating expenses includes 1.2 billion in Section 8 payments to landlords, plus 1.4 billion in salaries and fringe, 612 million in contracts, 513 million in utilities, and 330 million in other expenses such as supplies and equipment. A significant portion of our expenses are fixed, such as the utilities and employee benefits. Because of the condition of our buildings, being in the state of disrepair that they are, we must take more from our capital fund to maintain our operating. In the 2021 budget, we had to use 35%, this is a permitted transaction, of our annual capital grant to sustain our basic operations and support the increases required by the pillar uh, areas. And typically we've only had to move about 15 to 25% of our capital funding uh, in these areas. I think we've handed out uh, slides uh, uh, to the membership uh, that convey some of this. And I'd like to take a moment to refer to those. Uh, if you have the PowerPoint in front of you. The first slide uh, is the five-year sources and uses. So for 2021, we're showing all the rental uh, revenue sources and other operating sources. You'll see rental, operating subsidy, Section 8 subsidies, the city funds, the capital transfer that I've mentioned. We also had to make a small withdrawal from our reserves. We also use funds that are available to us from the PACT pro and RAD proceeds and other revenues to get to that 4.058 number. The expenses, including a head count of proposed of 11,811 individuals, include the salaries, the fringe, funds for overtime. The five-year projections are shown as well and we will have to deal with each one of those as the budget year unfolds. We're hopeful that uh, the change in administration will help us there uh, uh, in Washington as we go through the year. So the first chart shows the small $25 million deficit. By way of uh, comment, HUD is beginning to send out the final formula numbers for the operating subsidy, and we're hopeful that they're gonna take into account the reduction in federal, uh, the loss in income from rent that we experienced. The second slide is a pie chart that shows the allocation across the various programs to the properties, to operations that support property services, central office and the leased housing programs. These are uh, conveyed uh, through the pie chart. About 57% is allocated directly to the properties and operations, 31% to leased housing program and about 12% to central office. The final slide that we made available is our budgeted headcount, showing that since uh, 2018, for example, we had a headcount of 10,684. 21 shows us at 11,811. And we've broken this down by uh, general functional area, property, property services, central office, and leased housing. And uh, this material is provided for uh, us to review today if you have questions on it. What about capital investments? NYCHA's capital budget comprises federal funding from HUD, FEMA for the Sandy recovery and resiliency efforts, city funding and state funding. We're gonna receive about 601 million federal capital funds this year. Our 2021 budget uh, allocates capital funding for building facades, windows, building systems, heat plants and elevators and interior renovations. Through the year 2025, we plan to replace 319 boilers, 281 elevators, at an estimated cost of 2.1 billion. Since 2019, we've replaced 43 boilers, but looking beyond 2025, we still have 103 boilers and 921 elevators 
to replace throughout the portfolio. With the federal capital funding we receive, it's far from what we need to address the 40 billion in capital need. In fact, I would say that the, with the expansion of the capital need that I mentioned earlier, the 601 million helps, but we're not getting a hold of that number at large. We're spending about $77 million a month on capital projects. There's more than a billion dollars of construction work, but that is in the context of the $40 billion worth of investment that's required. That's why we do need to act on an investment strategy and we, knew to, knew we need to act on it soon. Due to the pandemic, the city instituted a six month funding moratorium on city funded capital projects. That impacted about 230 projects that were on hold. We were, however, able to shift a substantial portion of those uh, to federal funding to keep some work going. And since the moratorium was lifted in November, 2020, we've been working with OMB and the controller's office to assess and restart the projects. As of, as of the end of 2020, we have completed about 2.2 billion worth of Sandy recovery, providing residents with new roofs and electrical systems, boilers, exterior lights, cameras, and the flood protection. And that has generated about 933 section three jobs. We expect to complete the work at 25 developments by the end of this year and have 95% of the Sandy work completed by the end of 2022 and close out all Sandy work by the end of 2023. We also have used HUD's energy performance contracting program to replace boilers and modernize heating systems. And this is uh, uh, spending capital dollars upfront based on the savings we receive when we make these improvements. Last year, we had an investment of 300 million in over 70 developments through the energy performance contracts. Since 2014, we've also invested about 200 million in cameras and security measures and another 100 million in exterior lighting. Mayor de Blasio committed an unprecedented level of resources to the authority, about 6.4 billion so far, 1.3 billion on roofs, 200 million on boilers. And to date, we've replaced over 200 roofs, benefiting nearly 47,000 uh, household residents. We also have our permanent affordability commitment uh, together, packed. And considering the age and the massive needs of our building, that 40 billion that I keep referring to, our PAC preservation is trying to take a bite out of that. This is comprehensive repairs and upgrades targeted to 62,000 apartments by the year 2028. Doing this while safeguarding resident rights and protections. I can't emphasize that enough. This program does focus on doing that in addition to bringing the capital in. So to date, we've done about 9,500 apartments that have been converted through the program. Um, that's about 50 developments, and that represents about 1.8 billion in capital improvement. Packed renovations include new kitchens and bathrooms, upgraded building systems such as elevators and boilers, improved grounds and common areas, and that includes new playgrounds and security systems. Another 12,000 apartments at 35 additional sites are slated to begin comprehensive repairs and upgrades by the end of this year. The way forward for us is twofold. We must make changes to NYCHA's organizational and operating uh, uh, processes. This must happen in tandem with major capital investments so that we could truly transform the institution and our buildings. These two paths support each other and will help turn the tide with respect to the immense cost that we have now of continually playing catch up for repairs due to the building conditions. Together with PACT, our blueprint for change, which includes the Housing Preservation Trust, plus the transformation plan, we think that over time we can begin to really make the dent in the physical needs and change the systems and services that uh, we must change in order to keep, keep uh, resident satisfaction and also begin our compliance. So um, the blueprint, as uh, many of you know, would include transferring developments from HUD section nine to section eight. Uh, we've doing this to access uh, the additional funding in the section eight program. This is a 100% public process. NYCHA continues to own the land and the buildings. NYCHA staff continue to manage and maintain the properties. 
residents maintain their full rights and protections. And in the process, we can create jobs and training opportunities. We need to provide residents with wholesale systemic improvements, not piecemeal fixes. It's been helpful to get the money that we've received for the various building components. But I'll be very clear, we must look at the building as a whole entity. We must invest in all the work, raise as much money to do as much repair in each property, each building. We cannot wait for Washington to do this. We're hopeful with the new administration, as the chair mentioned in her opening remarks, but we need your support too to make sure that the authority will be able to serve generations of New Yorkers to come. So that's an overview of uh, capital budget operating. So thank you for listening through this and we're happy to answer questions and look forward to keeping you updated as these plans evolve and improve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Russ. Thank you for that, that opening. Um, we, we're going through a lot as a city and the purpose of this budget hearing is to you know, clearly get a sense of where NYCHA stands uh, with your operating side, your operating budget, as well as the capital. Um, but I wanna start with um, just putting this all into context because the city of New York, the agencies, NYCHA, you're struggling. You're struggling financially, you've been struggling. But at the same time, New Yorkers are struggling. Mm -hmm. Your residents are struggling. And we keep hearing about the, um, the you know, how it's difficult to pay rent. Um, and you talked about this in your, in your um, testimony. So I just wanna start there. During the COVID-19 pandemic, from March, 2020 to January, 2021, NYCHA reports that about 56,600 households have submitted interim recertification requests to decrease their monthly rent payment due to a reduction in income or a complete loss of income. And that about 36,000 of these requests were associated with rent hardship. It is NYCHA's estimate that about 36,000 households or about 10% of all the residents are experiencing a rent hardship directly due to the pandemic. Is this, is this an accurate number in the accurate accounting? Uh, yeah, just let me be clear that the 36,000 households represents about 22% of the occupied households, not individual residents. Uh, and they've had an interim a recertification approved for a change. And uh, those are almost all exclusively decreases due to loss of income. As of the end of January, we've had about 28,000 annual research that also resulted in a rent decrease. And in the voucher program, we've processed about 11,400 reductions. So interims, annuals, and the voucher program, there's a substantial number of our families that have benefited from the rent formula and from uh, the hardship program overall. So how much of so how much of the requests that were submitted were actually approved? How much were approved? So um, of the interim requests we received, we declined about 35 percent, about uh, 13,700. Some of these were withdrawn by the tenant, some were unfounded, some were duplicate requests, and some were so close to the annual recertification that we processed that in lieu of the interim research. Okay, do you still have a vacancy rate of less than 1% right now? Um, I believe we do, but let me ask the general manager if that number is, is, is accurate. Sure, I believe it is as well, but we are confirming that number right now. We certainly have seen overall a lower vacancy rate uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, but if you could just give us a, a minute and we'll confirm that number. Okay, okay, okay. And you went from a 94% um, collection rate of rent, of rent to what? 
As of January, our rent collection is around 80.4%. And uh, we estimate that it had about 66 million in lost tenant revenue due to the pandemic. Um, so there was a significant shift. Okay. And that revenue um, that you do receive from the residents of NYCHA is what percentage, again, of your overall revenue? Um, could, um, is Aliko on? Could she just respond to that, please? Thank you. Sure. Um, this is Anika Lascott. Sorry, Anika. Uh, that's okay. Um, Anika, Anika. Yeah. I I like you both very much. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> but thank you, um, Chair. To answer your question, our tenant rent is about a third of our overall budget. Okay. Okay. And going back to the um, recertification requests that were declined, you said 35%. Um, can you give me just some common reasons why those were declined? Some were duplicate requests and some we actually processed through the annual recertification. So um, some were withdrawn by the tenant and some were determined to be unfounded. So those are circumstances where we couldn't uh, validate uh, the request. Okay, so I'm looking right now just at the, um, the cumulative rent collection rate chart and just looking at the fact that every single month there's been a decline. Um, and so are you anticipating a continued decline in um, the rent collection? Because this is a significant drop when you look at yes. 2020 to 2019. Yes. So uh, our observation is that two things are happening. We continue to see the, uh, and you know, we've We've discussed this and you mentioned it in your opening remarks. The impact on our families is significant. And if we could call it the COVID economy, I think it falls disproportionately on our residents. I just, I just think that's a fact. I think the kinds of work that they have um, is, is sensitive to what's happened through COVID. So on that part, uh, until the economy comes back and maybe there's more openings, I do think we're going to see rent reductions uh, occur. Secondly, I think this rent reduction was actually occurring not to this degree, but prior to COVID as well. And I think some of that results from the conditions that our families are in. So I think those two things together are driving uh, this reduction in rental income um, and I, I believe it's likely to continue, certainly for the COVID impact through uh, a good part of this year uh, and maybe for the whole year. Uh, I do think the economy has been very, very rough uh, for our families, uh, especially those that work in service. Uh, for example, service industries had part-time jobs, uh, uh, that kind of thing. I, I, I think it's been just devastating. So uh, I expect our rents are going to be low. Um, and we're hopeful that, that HUD uh, makes some adjustments for that in their operating fund formula. Uh, we're, we're waiting to hear. And we're hopeful that Washington recognizes that over the long term. I think some of what's in the recent bill that passed will help our families. But um, I do think that we're, uh, we're going to continue with the low rent uh, rent. And rent. Okay, I also want to recognize our majority leader, Lori Combo, who's also joined us. Um, thank you for being here. Um, so along those same lines, um, because we know that it's been difficult and challenging for our residents, um, which is why they've put in the request for um, a, a rent reduction. But in addition to that, you also mentioned that some of the, de the decrease is also related to the conditions of the buildings and um, the fact that maybe residents are just not paying rent because they, are, they feel like they're not being provided a certain service. Um, have you at all, has NYCHA filed evictions against residents in 2020? Not for rent payment. I mean, we are prohibited from that. I do think we've had some terminations related to health or safety. And um, 
Uh, I'm going to ask the general manager if he could uh, uh, give us a few numbers on that. So first, I'd like to know how many um, eviction proceedings were um, you know, pushed forward. In, in 2020, for those reasons, I think about 470. For any, for any reason, how many eviction um, proceedings well, have you filed for 2020? 417. That's correct. Is that good? OK, thank you. OK. The, and now like, can you break down the whys? Yeah, uh, these were for safety, health, quality of life, or behavioral issues that that created a safety hazard in some way. These were these were not related to rent. Okay. Now we'll have some follow up um, just on the side because. Sure. You know, there are issues where, you know, we've heard from residents who said that they were um, being evicted and it is not at all due to safety, health and quality of life, but that's the terminology, you know, that is stated to, um, to Central, but not necessarily what's actually happening on the ground with the relationships between residents and, you know, possibly the property managers. And so I just want to be able to kind of dig a little deeper into the 400. Sure, uh, we could we could we could uh, talk about that offline and and give you the information that we have on those cases. Okay, we've also been joined by Councilmember Salamanca. Okay, moving on. The Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities Act, known as CARES, signed into law in March 2020 provided approximately $12 billion nationally to HUD for community development and housing programs. Can NYCHA provide details on how much federal stimulus money it has received, through which programs, and how the funding is being utilized? And are there restrictions or guidelines for the spending of these funds? So NYCHA received approximately $150 million in CARES Act, um, and that included an additional 37 million for a section eight administrative fees. Um, I'm gonna let uh, uh, Anika kind of give you the flavor for that and what that was used for and how we, we we're spending that money and uh, what the expenditure requirements around that were. Sure, thank you, Chair. So as the Chair mentioned, NYCHA received 150 million of CARES Act public housing operating funds and 37 million in CARES Act Section 8 administrative fees. Those flexible funds can be used to support COVID response effort and our normal, and our normal program expenses. The deadline has been updated so that all funds must be spent by December 31st, 2021. Through 2020 year end, NYCHA has spent 120 million of our CARES Act public housing funds on eligible operating expenses and close to 3 million in CARES Act Section 8 funds. We anticipate that we will meet the year end expenditure deadline. Anika, what's eligible operating expenses? Like, I, I just want you to tell me what you spent the money on. That's all. Sure. So in terms of eligible operating expenses, the funds can be used for anything that you could use your normal federal public housing operating funds for. So in NYCHA's case, we used $120 million to support our utilities, actually. Um, and that was helpful to us because we were seeing a reduction in rent. And so these CARES Act funds helped us to bridge that gap. And what else? That's the full amount, $120 million. Not So utilities? It was all yes, utilities. correct. Um, and just to give you some context, so we had $88 million of COVID expenses in general across NYCHA, um, and we spent that money on um, COVID safety measures, protective equipment, and staffing. So when we're thinking about the full breadth of what it has cost us to respond to the COVID pandemic, it's $88 million. In addition, we had $66 million in rent collection losses as a result of the pandemic, which are not covered by any federal source. Okay, what would be the potential impact of the most recent one, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 that was signed yesterday, 
um, to NYCHA programs and budget. And I know that, uh, you know, when I was just reviewing the bill itself last night mm -hmm. um, and was looking at the emergency um, vouchers and just trying to comb through to find out what, if anything, yeah. it was a poll from the air. Chair, that's a, that's a great question. We've, we've been combing through it as well. Uh, I mean, significant piece of legislation individually, uh, uh, much, much uh, needed benefits. When we looked at the, what we have coming on the housing side, there is a 5 billion nationally in a temporary housing voucher. Uh, we're not sure we, we the uh, Congress gave uh, the HUD secretary a lot of discretion in distributing this money. Uh, if it's done similar to what's happened in the past, we could estimate possibly receiving another 300 million in voucher funding. But there's some caveats here that we should be aware of. First, these are temporary vouchers. Um, funds will be available on a, uh, a limited basis. They're targeted. In other words, they're specific groups, homeless, recently homeless, at risk, victims of domestic violence. I mean, uh, these are all worthwhile, but they are targeted. And there are uh, 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 kind of a sliding scale in terms of the availability that is, uh, the bill allows for funding to be used through 2030, but if a voucher is uh, terminated uh, after September 2023, you cannot reissue. So um, uh, we don't have a number yet. Uh, I think uh, Congress gave HUD 60 days to come up with a formula. So as soon as we have a number and we know the impact, we can talk about it. Uh, and also, uh, one thing I want to point out is we did not get any increase in operating subsidy, uh, and nor was there any uh, capital, although uh, capital potential exists uh, in some future legislation. Uh, Chair, if I may, I just want to go back to uh, two questions that were asked. So when we did confirm the vacancy rate is 1.3%. Okay, so that is the correct number. And I just want to just clarify earlier when we were talking about, I believe your question to the chair was how many eviction proceedings um, did we commence? Uh, I just want to clarify that the 417 uh, number that Chair Russ provided, that's how many uh, termination of tenancy actions we commenced, not evictions. And there is a vast difference. Those are administrative proceedings that could potentially lead to an eviction proceeding. Right, but we did not bring 417 eviction ah, proceedings thank you, Vito. in housing court. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. That is helpful. Um, how many did make it to housing court? Any? I, I don't, we're gonna confirm that, but I don't believe any were brought to housing court okay. for eviction at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Um, just a quick follow-up and, and, and after this question, I'm gonna stop there and allow my colleagues to ask questions because I'm looking at the hour now. Um, Going back to your COVID-related expenditures, can you just break down the spending on your family leave um, payouts as well as the um, paid sick leave? Because I'm just trying to comb through and I know you're sure. operating costs and different things, but I'm just looking over your charts, um, how much of your expenditures were actually related to having to pay for sick leave and family leave? Anika, do you have... Uh... The opportunity to can you provide that? Um, we will get right back to you with that number. Okay. All right. Thank you. I am going to stop there, Audrey. Sure. Thank you. Um, I will now call on council members to ask questions in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, including responses. If there's a second round of questioning, council member questions will be limited to two minutes. Uh, Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and let you know when your time, up, time is up. Uh, we will begin with council member Rosenthal followed by council member Salamanca. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Great to see you, Chair Russ and General Manager Mustacello. Yes. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Chair Amprey Samuel. 
uh, for holding this hearing. I, I don't quite know how to ask this question, so try to think broadly um, when I ask it. I'm wondering if since you've come on board, Chair Rush and Chair Russ and General Manager Mustuchello, since you've come on board, have you been able to do any sort of deep dive analyses that were that showed you that there were inefficiencies or showed you that there was something funky in procurement? Um, something funky in staffing levels, you know, um, anything where you saw there might be opportunity for savings within the budget because of whatever reason. Does that make sense, my question? Yes. Um, in, in fact, we have. Uh, part of the uh, reorganization that we're, we had to do or will be doing uh, uh, with uh, the HUD agreement involves looking at these various business processes. It involves looking at the steps we're taking. I had a presentation a few weeks ago, for example, on a streamlined approach to recertifications. Yeah. Uh, that's an enormously time consuming and painful process. If you talk to any resident, they, they, you know, and uh, that's on the, the table for uh, sort of rejiggering the steps and trying to make it less me, staff intensive and less me, resident. Let me um, just jump in with that example. Um, sounds like a good one. I only have five minutes, so forgive me for interrupting. Okay. Um, that's a great example. So you identified that, but you haven't implemented it yet, but it's on the table to be implemented. Very exciting. What are the roadblocks that make it difficult to implement that streamlining idea? So I think we have implemented, uh, part of this grew out of the, the rent hardship. Uh, HUD gave us waivers on specific administrative things that we could uh, uh, change. And uh, the ideas sort of came out of the COVID waivers that HUD provided. And we have a list, uh, in fact, uh, uh, on Vito's team, there's a, there's a wonderful person, she's a great technician, uh, who has a whole list of things we're gonna change. And um, I think uh, part of the problem for us is that we've had an embedded structure and approach for such a long time. It's just releasing ourselves to, to make those changes. But we are, we are in the process of making them. I don't know, Vito, if you wanted to add uh, anything on the research process uh, to the council member's question? Yeah, Craig, I, look, the only, I would just add a very broad um, uh, comment, which is my, my philosophy in government has always been that there's always room for improvement. Right? And when you stop making improvements, you should leave government, right? You should not continue to serve. Uh, it's been a challenge and, and on a lot of fronts um, and since I've been here at the authority. I think we have made a lot of progress, and I think Chair Russ gave one example. I think another great example is the um, uh, looking at, at our existing contracts with the unions and, and how we can improve on the level of service that we deliver to our residents. That's continuing. Um, we've had some great dialogue with the unions, and that will continue. Uh, but I think these are some great examples. Look, certainly the agreement holds us to a higher standard. Right. Um, so, so there is always room for improvement, um, and I think that you've touched on a few of the areas when it comes to the level of service, the, the delivery of service, um, when it comes to procurement. These are all issues that we're very focused on. I it guess, won't happen overnight. Yeah, no, for yeah. sure. And uh, I have 30 seconds left. So, um, Chair Ampresimo, if it's okay with you, I would love a follow-up meeting with the folks who are working on this at NYCHA to see what they've implemented, what they're thinking about implementing and sort of think about the hurdles. I'd love an overview presentation if that is possible. And lastly, I will just say that- Time expired. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I'm done. Thank you so much. Sure, that lastly, are you going? 
because you can move forward if you want. <laughs> well, I mean, we're seven and a half years into the de Blasio administration and it's just a tiny bit painful to hear, you know, we have some good ideas going forward. But Vito, you've been there a minute and same with you, Chair Russ, um, but it, seven and a half years in, um, I was hoping we would have been able to make a little more progress, but I appreciate you. That's it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Council Member Salamanca. Time starts now. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, just to go in line with what Councilman Ro Rosenthal was saying, um, Vito, I know that you just got there at least a year and a half, called two years, and Russ, you as well, but not your team, not, not, not the permanent government, what we call there. So um, my question is, back in fiscal year, I would say 17, 18, I allocated $3 million for capital dollars for Merrill's houses. And, and I believe it was improvements for security. What has happened with those $3 million that I was able to secure for NYCHA? So I'm going to, uh, thank you, Council Member. It's good to see you, by the way. Yes, and, I'm uh, sorry. It's good to see you, too. You yeah, too. no, it's okay. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Stephen on the capital side if he can give you an update. Thank you, Member. Thank you, Member. Um, council member. Um, and I, you know, we talk about a lot about the commitment rate and last year at this, um, sorry. I have five can minutes. Can you hear me now? My time is going sorry. down. I can hear you. Nope. Yes. If you could um, just answer my question. What is going on with the $3 million that I gave to Merrill's houses um, fiscal year between 17 and 18? Um, our, um, I will get back to you. I don't know that particular can you not know if you're in charge of capital projects and you're at this hearing to, to talk about the budget? See, Chair Russ, this is a problem with some of these uh, agents. They come unprepared knowing that we're going to ask these questions. You know, especially we're here for a budget here. You should be prepared to know that Councilman Salamanca allocated $3 million and every year I ask the same question and every year I'm told we're going to get back to you. I mean, yes, and we have um, last year at this point in time, um, I had said that we were going to get control of the council member spending um, because every year we've been doing better and better on our spending rates. Um, we hired an individual who has been reaching out and has reached out to almost all of the council members. Um, what we're doing is we've been uh, focused on those projects. And we've focused a group on those projects of the council members in order to move them forward. I know that this year in terms of the security, um, and I'm pulling up the document right now in our program, um, that was planned for completion in 2024 and it's currently in design. Um, there was the moratorium that would impacted all of our city council funding projects um, for over a six month period of time. And this one was impacted by that. Um, so I allocate, I allocate, I, I allocated money, $3 million, fiscal year 17 and 18 to you guys. And they're telling me that this won't be completed till 2024. This is what discourages council members from wanting to allocate capital funding in NYCHA because it's just gonna sit there. I'm gonna move on to my next question, thank you. Um, I, I have a question about the alternative, the AWS, the alternative work schedule. This morning, my, my, one of my NYCHA presidents, Danny Barber, was mopping and cleaning his buildings uh, because there was no one there to do the job. And it's my understanding that Tuesday through Sunday, there's no full staff, that the staffing is staggered. And there are three shifts and there are major issues with the way shifting is done, um, staffing is done. Um, I was wondering, um, Chair Russ or Vito, if you guys can explain to me um, why why my my president uh, from this NYCHA development feels that he has to clean because NYCHA staff are not doing it. Sure. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, the alternative work schedule was uh, groundbreaking, really, for the Housing Authority. We had not seen a change in work schedules um, contractually in over 50 years. 
I, and and I um, am the first to say that that we've had some real challenges with the implementation, right? Um, and like most changes of that magnitude, it takes time to perfect, right? Um, and we are looking at it a number of different ways. We're looking at at um, did we take the right approach with the work schedules that we um, proposed, right? And we're actually looking um, at some developments to see where we can do a pilot. Uh, to see where we can make improvements. Did we have the right level of supervision? Right? And, and you know, the answer is, you know, no, we did not. Right? But all of these uh, you know, uh, changes that we need to make come with a big dollar amount. Um, so we're trying to be mindful of working within a limited budget. Um, but the bottom line is it's to really to improve services. Time expired. Thank you. All right. I, I want to continue having these conversations uh, with you, Chair Russ, and you, Vito because my uh, Danny Barry shouldn't have to be mopping his buildings. That should be something that we have paid staff to do. Um, and I think it's unacceptable. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to ask questions. Council Member Salamanca, are, is that all of your questions? Because I see we don't have a lot of council members with questions. And I just want to make sure that you've been able to- Yeah, at, at, the, mom, at the moment, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We'll now take questions from Council Member Ayala, followed by Majority Majority Leader Cumbo. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, considering that we only have five minutes, I'm going to ask my questions and then I'll just wait for the response. But uh, one, I, I would love to know a little bit more about what the actual budget is for uh, COVID related cleaning, specifically in senior buildings. I was at a senior building the other day and I will tell you that it was filthy. It looked like it hadn't been cleaned in months. That was at Corsi houses, just for the record. Uh, Mitchell houses, uh, Mahaven houses, Millbrook houses, all disgusting. Mitchell houses happens to have a senior building on site as well. I mean, but really just beyond dirty. Um, they have been spraying the buildings. However, I don't see the logic of spraying it for COVID and yet the conditions being what they are, like the, those two don't fit for me. Um, so that's one. Secondly, uh, we've had a multitude of shootings in my district specifically, so I can only speak for myself, but this is the list of shootings since last July to now. They're well over 50 at this point. I would love to know if there's any resources being um, allocated uh, by NYCHA to address the public safety of the residents, specifically the broken lights and the cameras in the immediate. And then three, a lot of my buildings seem to be transitioning over to PAC. Um, I find out about it through residents, never through NYCHA, which is a problem for me. But for the buildings that are transitioning, I have one building in particular, 335 East 111th Street, that didn't have access to mailboxes for well over six months in the middle of COVID. That meant that people that lived in that building didn't have access to uh, their food stamps recertification packages, Medicaid recertification packages, uh, things that were essential to their survival throughout the pandemic. The post office will hold your mail for a certain amount of time. And then after that, they will no longer hold it. We kept calling and calling and they kept telling us that they were waiting for a vendor. They were waiting for a vendor when in fact, what I really think was happening was that, they were, that NYCHA was waiting for the transition to actually occur so that the new management company could remediate that. I would have appreciated it if at least somebody would have said that to me, as opposed to continuing to tell us that somebody was gonna to get to it, somebody was gonna to get to it because we were in the middle of a pandemic. It's hard enough not having access to your mail on a regular day, but in the middle of a pandemic in a community of color, one of the communities that's the most highly impacted that people don't have access to information that can potentially be a lifeline to a specific service to me is has this, there's no way to justify that. So I would love to know why it is that these projects are being held. Um, and in, specific, in cases like this, like why? Because it made no sense to me. I only have five minutes, so sorry, I know it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm I think- Okay, I'm sorry. It took me a minute to get unmuted. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna start with uh, uh, the cleaning because I think it follows on from the prior council member's question. Um, here's what we want to drill down to. At some point, I want to have a cleaning schedule for every building that tells you the number of times hallways are going to be done, stairwells, common areas. 
uh, there used to be cleaning schedules like this, we'll reinstitute them. Um, this is part of the revamp of the AWS system uh, that we're going to be looking at because once those schedules are established, I want to publish them so that anybody who comes in the property or in the building can see when someone is supposed to be doing that work. And then we can measure and make sure that that cleaning is occurring against that schedule. Because the fundamental caretaker cleaning is different from the COVID cleaning. We spent about 36 million on COVID cleaning, which is all touch point uh, cleaning. And this issue that you're describing continues to come up over and over and we have to fix it and we're committed to do so. But it's gonna require that we take uh, each property, we're gonna take each building and have that schedule and that structure. Um, once that's done and we test and verify, um, I'd like to roll that out to the entire system. And that includes the labor hours required to make sure that that hallway is clean, the stairwells are clean and the supervisory or quality check time as well. Because what you described is not acceptable and we need to make a remedy. We need to remedy that. And it's obvious when you go into buildings when it's been done or not been done. Um, the second thing I would say, uh, uh, let me jump to your, your RAD. I'm um, expired. I'm, if I, you, is I, I, before you jump to the RAD. Yeah. I kind of want to hone in on the, on the, the cleaning of the buildings. Sure. And the reason why is because, you know, I, like, I, I actually was going to have a question about that because last year there was an announcement of a cleaning schedule with the vendors, right? And so we actually <clears throat> want to know what happened with that process with the vendors and the, and the amount of money that was allocated for, for that, as well as what's happening with the, you know, overall cleaning of the buildings. And this is a great opportunity to explain what's happening with the staffing because that went back to my first question, my previous question around how much money was paid out for sick leave and um, family leave to kind of get at, you know, what is your staffing like right now anyway because of COVID. And so um, I would like for you to expound a little more. On oh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip over to Vito uh, to give some detail on that. And I just want to know, I quoted you, you said, I want to have a cleaning schedule. And it made me cringe a little bit, Greg, because I want you to have a cleaning schedule, not that you want to have a cleaning schedule. Yeah, I no, mean, I, I, what I, the I hell actually, is he talking about? <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> Chair, I, I, uh, I want to be able to go in a building and know when someone's supposed to be doing the halls, the stairwells, the common areas, the windows. That's the goal. And if I want to know it, who should want to know it better than the residents who live there? And I want that to be shared with them so that they can see that that work is getting done or not, because if it's not done, we have an issue. So let me go to Vito though, for your follow-up. Oh, my question. bad, I thought that existed. I actually thought- so They existed. are around. I mean, some sites are doing them and, and they, they are there. They are, there are scheduled. Some of them go back years and years, but we do not have consistency and repeatability. That's the part that, that is a struggle. So if I could just briefly add, so I, I think there's a, a big difference between the uh, the disinfecting that we started during at the beginning of the COVID uh, pandemic that we continue uh, to perform, which we do, we, we had a schedule that was posted on our website and, and cleaning services. Right. So we started, as you all know, um, just a weeks, weeks after the pandemic first started with a disinfecting schedule where we were disinfecting non-senior buildings three times a week, senior buildings uh, five times a week. Uh, the changes that have um, been made to the guidances issued by the state and the federal government uh, have moved us from that schedule to, we are now disinfecting buildings once a day, all buildings, whether it be a senior building um, or a family building. And we're disinfecting the high touch point areas, uh, mainly in the, in the lobbies so it's the elevator control buttons in the lobbies, the mailboxes, the doors. Um, so we have changed that, that process based on a change in guidance issued um, primarily by the state. Right. What we're talking about also here too is a difference between the daily cleaning. And, and I agree with Chair Russ and with both of the council members. 
uh, we need to improve, right? But part of that is also to kind of set a level playing field for our staff, right? Our buildings have not been maintained in decades. And, and what we have found is just by putting more caretakers into the buildings to mop over existing uh, years and years of dirt, that is not helpful. Um, so we, we've done this in a, in a few um, buildings. It's been extremely successful is we're coming in first to strip the floors, right, to provide a new coating of wax um, and, and allow really the caretakers to have a, a better surface, an easier surface for them to maintain, right? Uh, because when they're going in there just to mop over, again, years and years of, of dirt, um, it, it's always going to look dirty um, and it will never be 100% clean. Uh, and as soon as we are at the point where we can start to have, and, and as the chair said, some developments do it, we need to be consistent in how we approach this. Um, and by putting that that mopping schedule, the cleaning schedule, on our website, we'll hold us accountable to that. Well, I just want to I just want to reiterate, you know, because I I know and I know you're you, you know I, listen, I've I've had this issue and I know that we have years and years of embedded dirt and you know that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like filthy, like I dropped soda and walked all over it, like coffee, you know, was spilled. I mean, I've gone, if you go, and I'm happy to do this with you, if you want any day of the week, any any time, I will cancel what I'm doing and walk you there. But I have been to uh, some buildings at Mitchell houses where the cobwebs on top of residential mm -hmm. doors are like this, and you have humongous spiders that have been living there and breeded there and have been, I mean, they're adults mm -hmm. now. Um, so it's not, you know, just a matter. And I, and I've been to, and I defended it because in the beginning of COVID, I was at some of my senior buildings and I accidentally walked upon the cleaning crew and they were like, you know, touch all of the high touch areas and they were very thorough. You could smell the cleanliness, you could smell the bleach. That's not happening anymore. They're coming and they're spraying and they're going. Even the elevators, like, I mean, when I walk into the buildings, I have to have a pen or something to touch the, the, the you know, the elevator buttons, which I normally, you know, wouldn't even care because I walk around with my, you know, sanitizer all the time, but I won't even touch them because they're that disgusting. And so that tells me, and specifically in the senior buildings is really, to me, is bothersome because these are already frail, you know, individuals that are living in these buildings and these conditions. And it, it's not only does it say we don't care about you, you know, but it's, 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 unsanitary and unhealthy and in the middle of a pandemic. So, right. you know, so, but it could be beyond just the mopping the floor. The floors are filthy, but the, so are the elevators and everywhere else. So Councilman, and, and just to kind of give a, a quick preview and, and we can obviously meet and talk about this in more detail. Yeah, you know, I think what the chair was really kind of talking about is um, where we're, we were going with this. So um, both consistency as well as accountability. Right. And by creating a schedule where you have um, caretakers who are assigned to buildings, so you know that that individual is responsible for the upkeep and the cleaning of that building, then we can start to hold um, staff accountable, make sure that we have the right resources. When, when, right. Are you, when are you rolling this out? By when would, would this new system be um, up? This, this is part of the transformation plan. Um, and you know, I'll, you know, the chair can talk more broadly about the transformation plan, but you know what we're looking to do here is to kind of is to, to pilot this. We've already done um, a, a pilot um, on part of the transformation plan um, in Queens, where we focused on on work orders and sequencing um, jobs, and it was extremely successful. We saw some really great results from that. Uh, we're looking to do something similar with the AWS caretakers work schedule um, in a few developments. Um, we can announce that shortly. We're still kind of working out some of the details of that. Um, and I just want to let you know too, I, I walked your development, this one of your developments this week um, with Chief Barrer and the NYPD um, with the TA leaders. Um, and it, look, we're going to start to do more of these where we're going to walk hand in hand with the TA leaders, with the uh, with the NYPD. It was extremely, um, it was an eye opener. It was enlightening. Uh, and no one better than the TA uh, leadership and the TAs who accompanied us but to point out where we need to improve. And if I, if I could, um, so in order, to, in order to get to this issue, there's going to be a work group that it's going to have uh, once we have the pilot sites, the TAs from those sites, we want to get a representative from CCOP. I want residents on this group. That group is going to begin to develop um, uh, the schedule that I talked about. This is a deconstruction 
of AWS in a manner of speaking. And then uh, the reconstruction is how should this building be treated? Uh, you know, how can uh, we deal with uh, uh, what you see? So that's, that is going to happen. That's the first working group of the reorganization that's going to become active, we hope, in the next few weeks. Because the residents have given us a lot of feedback, uh, a lot of uh, important feedback on how often things should happen. And, and, and let's capture that. So, so that's one thing. To Vito's walkthrough on, and your security question, um, we're going to this property-based budget. And you know, I know when I say that, it's like, oh, it's some administrative thing. And, and I get that. But the budget, the difference is there's going to be resources that are controlled at that level. Too much of uh, our decision making is too far from, from where the issue is. So we want to uh, be able to put, if you're walking around on a, a tour and you see a broken light, you should know that you've got the resource to fix it and get it done. And uh, we're also thinking of attaching uh, to each property a small capital fund for things like extraordinary maintenance and things like that, so that the property resources are there. I don't have this all stood up yet. It's going to take us some time, but that is where we want to move to. And uh, I hope uh, with the, the schedule and the discipline of it, we can get to the cleaning issue and with the resources, we can get to some of these persistent security issues like lighting, uh, for example. Um, so that's a- Just wanna that, remind the, you there, and I don't mean to be the dead horse, but these are people that have died in your development in the last six months, seven months. And I think that we, listen, obviously this, you know, police play a role in this. However, I have never been to a shooting response where I've seen a single person. Well, I'm not. I'm gonna. I'm not. I'm lying there. I have seen Vito from time to time. Um, there's a certain circumstances, so I will take that. But it, for the most part, whenever you have shootings in public housing, Nitro is the last person to respond, uh, unless it happened in an apartment. Like it's almost as if the entity is completely removed from the situation and you're the landlord and these are your residents and you're responsible for ensuring not only their quality of life but their public safety and broken doors and we've said this a million times and i know and i'm sure that we're not going to be able to rectify broken doors broken lights you know uh the fact that we're funding and paying for security cameras that oftentimes are also broken and then nobody's coming back and saying hey council member we don't have the resources but maybe if you could help us out this budget so that we can have you know, operational funds to maintain these cameras, that conversation has never happened um, because again, this was not NYCHA's idea, right? I, NYCHA didn't say to us, we need um, cameras in our developments. We imposed that on the on the agency. And I and I, it feels almost like a resentment, like, you know, well, you know, they're there, they're, you know, they work, they work, if they don't work, they don't. But again, I will remind you that these are people's lives. and. And you know, I'm really concerned about that. I'm concerned about the fact that we continue to rely on NYPD, you know, to deal with the public safety of the residents. And then, not, and and no point is someone from NYCHA going saying, you know what? Maybe we should have. Maybe we need a social, you know, the social services department needs to go to this apartment because this family is obviously in trouble, and we want to help them before somebody in that apartment gets killed or kills somebody else. You know, that is a problem for me. That is a problem for me because. It's not, it's not an isolated incident for me. And I, you know, it's not isolated. It happens to me every single day. Yesterday I had a double shooting and then shots rang out at the same time, just a few blocks from there. Every single day, this is happening in my community. It doesn't happen, you know, in most communities, but it happens in some of ours. Council, you know, uh, Chair Samuels will tell you that she shares the same experience. Council member Salamanca will tell you that he shares the same experiences. The only thing that we have in common, sir, is that we're black and brown and that we represent those people. That's not okay. Like it's, it's, it's horrible that we live this way. And, and you know, the, the fact that we don't have somebody to knock on that door really bothers me because it says to me, well, this is not our issue. This is a police matter. And, you know, quite frankly, I, I, 
know that the police has a role to play in these situations, but not all of the time. We should not be using the police department in that way because we could we could really solve a lot of these problems before they get to that point. Um, so I just really want to want to bring that up, and then maybe if you could just answer because I know I, I'm sure my colleagues have a lot of questions, and I've taken up way too much of you know of the time today, but. Um, the issue with the repairs at the buildings that are transitioning, um, because that issue with that mailbox really has bothered me. So um, we're responsible to the building changes over. And uh, I've, we've repeated that over and over. That should not, uh, we're not saying let's hold off till it goes red. I don't believe that is, that's not right. We have responsibility to do it um, till that is changed over to uh, the development team. Now, in the case you described, the, P the development team did come in and address the mailbox issue. Um, so um, that's on us. We should not have, we can't, and I've, we've repeated this over and over, we can't be sitting here saying, oh, it's going to go rad, I'm not going to do something. And if I find out about it or Vito finds out about it, we will take action uh, because that's not how we're supposed to operate. After it's closed and the, their, their, the formal transition has taken place, okay, that's different. And even then there's things we wanna do to make sure that the team is following up on certain compliance requirements. Well, I'll, I'll let you know that my interactions were not with management, they were with InterGov. I have submitted and I have the emails documenting the many exchanges regarding this specific building and the issue with the mailboxes. And I was being assured, you know, repeatedly by Intigov that we were waiting for a vendor when in fact no vendor ever came. And the issue was only, you know, addressed once the transition occurred. Immediately after the transition occurred, new mail mailboxes miraculously appeared. I'm excited for those residents, but it really, hurts me to a core to know that in the midst of one of the most trying times in people's lives that the most vulnerable people didn't even have access to mail that could have potentially had, you know, uh, documentation that they needed to, to maintain, you know, uh, their, their, their SNAP benefits, their Medicaid, things that they needed in the middle of this pandemic. And that, that the fact that that was not taken seriously enough, I think needs to be looked at. Um, and so I just, I, you know, um, wanted to sure. bring that to your attention. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair, sure. for the time. Uh, Chair, can I please um, ask that someone unmute um, Anika for us? She just wants to give an update um, on an earlier question. Great. Thank you, Vito. Um, so Thanks. Chair Empry Samuels, I just wanted to follow up on your question about the paid um, sick leave and expanded family leave. So I want to let you know that NYCHA spent $6.8 million on paid sick leave or expanded family and medical leave for specified reasons related to COVID-19. And the number of employees that were impacted is 2,147. Um, also wanted to note for you that during the coronavirus pandemic, we also hired temporary frontline staff in the form of seasonal workers and per diem workers to supplement our caretakers at the properties. And that cost us 12.3 million. Thank you. So the, is that part of the eligible operating costs? Excuse me? Is that part of the eligible operating costs when I asked a question related to the money that came from the CARES Act? No, we did not spend CARES Act funding on that. Um, I maintain that we spent the 120 million on the utilities that helped us to supplement all the coronavirus responses. At the time that the funds were given to us, we were told that they had to be spent by December 31st, 2020, or else they would have to be remitted to treasury. So okay. there was a big push at the time to spend down all of the funds as quickly as we could on operating expenses so that we could free up our normal operating dollars to just respond to coronavirus costs as they come in. But that would have been an eligible expense if you didn't Correct. have time constraints. Correct, All right. correct. Thank you. We'll now take questions from Majority Leader Cumbo. Time starts now. 
Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Amprey Samuel, for holding this hearing. Um, and I thank all of NYCHA for being on this call at this time. I want to um, I want to piggyback on what uh, Councilmember Salamanca was discussing in terms of the capital improvements. So myself, I'm also equally concerned about as a council member who's term limited and I have nine months to go, it's been very difficult for us to gain an understanding and, um, and to the commissioner, we've spoken about this in terms of really prioritizing the projects that council members have put forward, um, particularly those that are leaving because once we leave, there's going to be new members who are not gonna understand the, I guess the pain and agony <laughs> and the fight that we've been involved in to get these projects funded and to have some level of support for them. Essentially, Councilmember Salamanca asked, where is that money? I too would like to know where is that money that we've allocated? How is it being, how is it being treated? How is the money rolling over? How is it? And I know that they said that there was a, a work had stopped during the pandemic, but a lot of the work that you described was in design. And so even during a pandemic, I'm confused as how in the in design phase couldn't still be ushered through the timeline and the pipeline of to completion because in design work, I would imagine could still take place during a pandemic. Could we talk about that? And could we talk about I guess specifically the projects in my district, but also in general, it seems like a lot of these projects that we've allocated maybe six, seven years ago are still not going to happen. So uh, we can go ahead and get an update from Stephen on this. Um, and here's what I'd like to offer too. Um, I'd like to do a, a briefing on this so you can see what we're seeing when the money is set aside and the steps that, that come to us with the, with the funding. Um, we're committed to better project management, there's no doubt, but I also want to uh, make sure that uh, we convey to you what, what the process is and what we have to do to, to begin. In some uh, cases, uh, property, projects identified wind up costing more. So we need to provide supplemental funds for that. But let's have that conversation so we could talk about how this thing uh, works, or in this case, what what contributed to the kinds of delays that you're calling out to us today. So I'm going to let Steve give us an update on the status of all the, the council money, the aggregate numbers, and then commit to being in a conversation with you about what these issues really look like. Mm -hmm. Council member, thank you very much for that question. Um, I think last year at this point in time was my first budget hearing and I had mentioned that I was going to hire a liaison. We were going to hire a liaison um, to help move the city council funded projects. And I'm pleased to say that we do have that person on board. Um, he's reached out to, I believe, every council member's office that has projects with NYCHA. And I believe it's making a difference. Um, you know, he started in August and we were able to repurpose over 13 projects that were stuck um, or get additional funding to them. That's more than we did the previous year. And as we look at our commitment rates over the last few years, um, we've actually increased our commitment rates year after year after year. I know that that doesn't answer your specific question about your project, um, but what, I'm, what I'd like to say is that we're trying different things to make sure that we can move these ahead uh, and focus on them. The, the question in regards to the funding moratorium, um, the funding moratorium actually was broad reaching. It was all city funds that came into capital. And so that meant all projects, if it was in planning, if it was in design, if it was in uh, procurement, um, budgeting, as well as construction, all of those were put on hold because we could not and cannot pay uh, professionals, architects and engineers to continue those projects. Um, I would, I'm happy to say that of the, the 212, more than 212 projects that we did um, put on hold, all of them have been restarted 
and we are moving forward on the process is either high, we already got the expired. back on board. Um, those that were in procurement have already started to move through the process and those products that were on construction immediately started up again. Let me ask you a question. Are you familiar with um, the basketball player from the, uh, I believe the New York Knicks, Taj Gibson? Yes. So Taj Gibson did a basketball court in my district in Ingersoll, and it seems to have happened in almost record timing. Um, and in fact, not only were they done in record time, it, it seems it's pro they're probably the most beautiful basketball courts I've ever seen in my life anywhere, either in the NBA, professional, wherever. Um, the Barclays Arena, these are really beautiful basketball courts. And there's something really very powerful about it because not only was it done quickly and effectively, um, but it was also really inspiring for the young people and the community to see these beautiful basketball courts um, within their community. And it did something very magical for the neighborhood. I mean, there are all these, there are all these capital improvements that need to be made but them seeing that they have a basketball court. And I mean, of course, the magic of Taj Gibson coming back and doing it um, helps. But these are the types of projects that I have in the pipeline to get done that have been stalled indefinitely. Now, Taj Gibson's foundation is more than open to the idea of partnering with NYCHA and the city to do these types of projects and basketball courts um, and other improvements. I know he did an ice skating rink um, in NYCHA, I believe over one of the basketball courts, I wasn't able to go, but I feel like these public private partnerships could be really instrumental in trying to move forward these projects. W what is it about that particular project that he was able to move that so quickly, an NBA basketball player from an outside entity coming within NYCHA to do a project like that. How is he able to move that forward so expeditiously and quickly and the agency itself is not? Well, um, I'm really glad that that happened. Um, I've actually, we've worked on a couple of different ways of procuring projects with outside individuals, very similar to that. Um, we're doing one with the DA's office on 15 courts where the funding is outside of NYCHA. Um, yet we're doing the project management for it. And it's been really rewarding, not, you know, in addition to the residents getting these beautiful basketball courts, um, we've been doing a connected communities, uh, which is something that I'm very um, proud of, that we're moving into stakeholder engagement. Um, I've been on some of the calls, the design of the basketball courts have all been created by the residents in the buildings on all of these 15 courts. The colors have all been chosen. And it's really empowering to see all of these children who are part of that community making the choices. I would like a track to go around the outside of the basketball court. I'd like the colors to be green rather than blue. And they're the ones that are making the decisions on these. So we've done this. We did this also with Montefiore uh, on, a, on a playground uh, for adult fitness. And we're doing more and more of these. Um, in addition to that, I want to get back to you know, what you said about the residents being a part of this. This has been the quintessential thing that we've been doing recently. We're, we created a, uh, a standard procedure in which we have stakeholder engagement. And that's not just stakeholder engagement, that's across the board. So that's with the development staff to make sure that they know and understand the projects that we're doing. It's with the resident TAs, but also the residents. So that way they're helping us make the decisions on a lot of different projects that we're doing within the development. And it's also part of getting council members and other funding individuals to know where their projects are. And that is one of the reasons why um, we hired the liaison so that way we could have that interaction. And um, I think there's more and more opportunities for this. So that way we can move those projects forward. To answer your specific question about the difference between a public private partnership and, and just moving projects through, um, it has a lot to do with the funding. And I know Councilmember Rosenthal and I've talked about this a little bit and, and I would like to get, um, we wanna do more, um, mainly because you know I, I think some of you have heard when we were doing the City Plus heating plant program, 
we did a flow chart on the public procurement process. And I lovingly refer to it as the unflowy flow chart. But we went in and we took a day here and a day here and a week here and a, and a few days here. And we were able to get enough out of that to increase that heating plant program by three months in the procurement process. And so I know it's just a day and a day, but I, it means a lot in terms of these overall projects. And that's what we've been doing day in and day out on all of these projects, particularly or, you know, our entire portfolio, but now we're focusing on the council member funded projects as well as others to make sure that we can pull out each and every day to make sure that the projects get done quicker. And council yeah, member, to, to your, I'm sorry, to, to your mm -hmm. specific question. This was, uh, this was private funding with uh, different contracting. And um, I do think your, your idea merits us really looking at how we do this uh, process and what we're able to do. Uh, that uh, when we, re we, we have a public responsibility, obviously, when we're spending public funds and there's procurement rules with come, that come with those. But in the particular example of the court, this was, uh, was, was really done uh, uh, sort of in a complementary way using different sources of money. And, and I think that's why it could move so fast as opposed to running through a typical procurement process. Um, I'm also interested in uh, figuring out how we could, you know, double down on that and take advantage of it in some way uh, that would benefit uh, the youth or others at those sites. But when you remove or step back from some of the procurement requirements, it does release the time. It speeds everything up. Well, I, I would just say to that, you have a proven track record and example of it in Taj Gibson. You have yeah. a willing participant who wants to do well more of these in yeah. terms of the entire city. And you also have someone in Taj Gibson who has the access and the ability and the desire and willingness to partner with other members of the MBA to also leverage their resources to do a similar type of project. So just, I mean, this, it's, it's a small thing, but it's a huge thing. No, it's, it's gigantic. It inspires the youth and they see these individuals and it provides something for them to do during those summer months when crime and other things are up because we, their ability to do things have been suppressed by dilapidated right. playgrounds, dilapidated basketball right. courts. And then, you know, so the issues that council member Ayala was speaking of um, are very much tied to the outlets and resources that our young people have. I know when commissioner Bratton was uh, our commissioner, he spoke often about the broken windows theory and somehow the broken windows theory got placed upon people in terms of if you see people congregating or if you see people, uh, loitering or smoking or peeing in public, he associated that with a broken window when in actuality, it was the broken window we were talking about and not the people. So right. you see areas that are unclean, if you see broken windows, if you see garbage, if you see dilapidated playgrounds, those are the things that provide uh, our breeding ground and a space for violence to occur when they are energized with these beautiful basketball courts and energy and things like that, it really changes the environment and how people see themselves. I mean, and we know it, if you were to walk into my house right now, you'd probably throw your McDonald's bag on the floor and go sit down because there's toys and mess and everywhere. But if it was a pristine apartment, you'd feel funny about even sitting down. So and it's, it's, it's that type of, it's that type of energy that we've got to turn around. I, I, I really like your example uh, uh, in terms of how this works because I do think one of the things that's happened to us is when you don't see the investment, when you don't see the new thing or you don't see even something that's in good repair, you begin to wonder about where you are and who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, that environment has an impact on you and, and I think that um, we, we could, I'd love to sit down or take some time because to the extent that we have playgrounds or playground equipment or basketball courts, 
that we could uh, make this investment bigger uh, with the help of, of, of folks like the, the NBA players, we, we could figure out how to do that, I think. And well, I, well, I would definitely and like to work with you on that. I would love to because um, I, one, one thing I will say is that it, it is painful often to see how we, we have thought about some of this, or at least the steps that have been laid out for us that we have to follow on, on certain spending. I'm not saying these came from a bad place. They came from a place of, of trying to balance how uh, government should work. But if somebody could do this at our properties to a larger scale mm -hmm. in a targeted way, why can't we support that? In other words, why can't we provide the staffing that's already budgeted and we don't have to procure anything? You know, right. we could do up, we could do, or, or we have a designer that's already under contract that could work with the folks that want to make the donation uh, and the contribution. And we can design, we can design ourselves to their private funding. These are, these are things that would keep us sort of from um, having to step into any kind of procurement quicksand, use the private money appropriately, the public money appropriately, and get the thing built. There so let's, let's, let's talk about that because I think there's ways we could uh, put those together in a, in a neat way. And I'd, I'd love to, to explore that with you. And I just want to close with something, Chair Ampri Samuel, you've been too generous with your time. I appreciate it. Um, this is directed towards the finance portion of this, but not. It's a separate, but it's also very important. And this might have been covered before I got on the Zoom. Um, has there been any communication on the federal, state, or city level in terms of coordinating efforts to get our homebound or shut in? or seniors or individuals that have disabilities, um, the vaccine? Has there been a plan orchestrated or put in place to make sure that those that are homebound um, are getting the vaccine and have some sort of, I guess, visiting nurse program or some sort of thing? A large issue that many of my seniors have, which is so unfortunate, is that because many of our NYCHA residents are not elevator, um, do not have elevator uh, capacity, and they've never been able to be moved to another apartment, some seniors just can't leave their homes. So it's has there been any plan or navigation or design to make sure that those that are homebound are getting the vaccine? I don't have, um, uh, and uh, we are working on this. I know that because it's come up in our discussions uh, uh, with uh, the state, city, and the health department. Mm -hmm. So um, it is. Um, uh, we're going to check on it, but I think what I the answer is, we've recognized this is an issue, and we've got to lay out. Uh, as we begin to roll out more and more vaccine options that this takes care of, because I agree with you. Uh, we're talking to community-based organizations and others about being able to connect to that person. Once we have this, <clears throat> once we have this figured out with the city, we could share it with you, but it has come up in the planning discussions. I think if I describe sort of the vaccine process, we had this initial, it's getting more routine and systemized and beginning to fan out to get to these hard to reach folks that you described. And uh, uh, we'll have something I hope shortly that, that could get to your issue in okay. collaboration with the partners. Um, for, from having these hearings for the last seven years, I know that mustering up a whole bunch of angry eloquence um, does not move the needle any faster than sedated, quiet, and calm voice. So I'll just say in my sedated, calm, quiet voice that something as serious as the vaccine process for those that are homebound needs to be something that's at the forefront of this entire administration from the top down. And I mean, from federal down to city. So the fact that it's still in conversation mode versus 
we're almost done with vaccinating all of our homebound seniors, like that's where we should be, um, is really bringing up an another egregious issue in the part of how we've handled the pandemic. So this particular response is not what I had anticipated in asking the question. I would have assumed at this stage that this would be something that would have been more expeditiously handled. So with the way that this pandemic has hit black and brown communities and all the issues that we're talking about in terms of the amount of people that have died during the pandemic, our seniors, that has to be at the forefront um, of how we handle the pandemic. It, it would be my advisement because it's not happening that after this call, this is put into fast forward motion about how we handle this. So I'll stop there. Um, and I, I, I think that from what we've heard today, there are a lot of great things happening at NYCHA, but you all have to figure out a way for that to be felt and communicated and understood by the electeds, but way more importantly by the people that live in NYCHA, because these are great. We've hired a monitor, we've hired a liaison, we've hired a this, but the frustration level is still the same. So we have to figure out how to change what you're saying is happening to people feeling it on the ground. And I'll end there. And thank you so much, Majority Leader. Um, and just so you know, like your questions were spot on and they needed to be asked and answered. So thank you so much. Um, we've also been joined by council member Vanessa Gibson. I do have some follow-up from the majority leader's questions. So Steve, you mentioned that there were 13 projects that were moving forward. Um, that is 13 projects out of how many? And the question I actually want to get on the record is how many city funded capital projects were halted across NYCHA's portfolio and how long and how is NYCHA prioritizing the city capital projects this fiscal year? So I just really want to know how to prioritize. Chair, uh, uh, just quickly, I, there were 212 that were placed on hold okay. and 157 are now active. Um, the rest are either uh, 31 have been completed, 13 have to be repurposed, and um, we have some that are on hold because they, uh, for a variety of other reasons, but we could get you a breakdown against that 212. Um, okay, I do and, want to uh, break down against yeah. 212, and is that city or is that all projects? No, is I believe that is, I believe if, if, in, my staff, correct me if I'm, I believe that is uh, city projects. Correct. City projects. Okay, thanks, Steve. Okay. So that, those, are, those are the city, uh, uh, right on to the city discussion we've been having. Okay, and with the city, the, the 212, what's the total cost for those projects? That I do not have. I don't know if Steve has that or not. Uh, but I could, we could and provide not, that to you. The, the, not cost, but the total funding that has been allocated for. Yeah, yeah right. No, uh, uh, I don't have that on the sheet okay. at the moment, but we could have that for you. Okay. And along those same lines, um, there's an, another follow up. Um, well, you know what? I'll, I'll pause there for my colleague. Do you have another question? So I know you have to be off by three. <laughs> That's relax. very kind of you, Chair Ampresi. Time starts now. You. Thank you. It, and this is really fast. Um, you know, I did have one of those sit down meetings with um, Steve, I'm not gonna pronounce your last name right. Lovesy? Okay. And, um, and we had two actually, and um, they were not satisfactory meetings. Um, but I'm gonna just focus on one piece that I found questionable. Um, there were two projects that I had put in the budget like 
in past years um, that where the buildings are now under rad pack. And so I was told, therefore, I can't fund these projects anymore because the rad pack will just take over everything. Um, you know, I don't know how to respond to that because like one of the projects is from, I think it's 2017, where um, I wanted to have cameras up in an open area, um, has a playground in it, seating area for elders. And the PSA had asked me many years ago to fund cameras, and I did. And now here's the moment of execution. And, you know, no wonder they all look at me funny. They think I never did it and I never followed up with them and I didn't care what they said to me where it's completely the opposite. And just help me, help me. What, what, what do I say to them? How, how is, it really didn't, you know, it doesn't make any of us look good and crime continues without any cameras uh, to help the PSA. Time expired. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Rosenthal. We work uh, uh, because of the funding issues associated to the city funds, um, but we work with the developers in, in order to get some of these projects to move forward under their portfolio. There's some times, depending on the construction time, if we can do it before the RAD deal is done. Um, but again, uh, I, I recognize the frustration, um, the fact that those developments got a lot more, um, you know, in terms of the RAD portfolio, they get an opportunity to uh, really get a comprehensive modernization um, that hopefully provides for the residents um, and yeah. we can work so, with our partners to make sure so, that they get this. You know, it's really Sorry. hard for me to hear this answer. Uh, Chair Russ, you yeah. want to step in here? I, I, well, first of all, I want to understand, this is what, these are my questions based on your question. Um, if it went rad, what difference does it make as to whether we're spending the money pre or post? Under the rad arrangement, NYCHA still owns the property. We're leasing it to this development entity. So my first question is, is there something that we can't see related to how this came to us that precluded us from putting this in? And secondly, I don't see why this couldn't be part of any transaction to make sure that the money gets spent, whether, <clears throat> pardon me, whether it's right before closing or right after closing. And, and to, to me, it's capital funding. And if, if, if I'm the RAD developer and you've put in a half a million dollars for, for lighting, uh, we could adjust that deal and say, here's half a million dollars. Now, if there's some restriction somewhere in the city process, I'd like to find that out, but here's what I could commit to do, council member. I'll take this back to the RAD real estate team and find out if there's some something I'm not seeing here because honestly, it's capital, it's all green, and it should all spend. Um, Appreciate you. Appreciate I, you very I, much. No, I, 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 and if I'm missing something, I'll be glad to come back and tell you what it is I'm missing because I, I just don't, um, I would say, okay, the developer said they were gonna put a, a, a million dollars in, there's 500,000 of city money. Now we'll, we'll mix that together and they can use that 500,000 somewhere else. They could do some other improvement. Maybe it's not as, as simple as I'm making it, but let's, let me find out why it, it couldn't, we, you know, and, and um, I'll make sure we have a note and we'll circle back, okay? Sure. Yeah, Chair Russ, I, you should know that the reason what you just said is helpful is because it's honest. It's an honest response, you know? Yeah, that does seem curious. So um, you can, I really appreciate you. I'd love you to circle back. Um, yeah, thank you. And Chair, thank you for letting me slip in there. Appreciate you. You're welcome.
Um, okay, so I have another series of questions um, related to last year's, well, related to the what we decided on um, with the mayor and the city council. As part of a budget agreement reached between the mayor and the city council, the fiscal 2021 adopted budget redirects approximately $537 million from the New York Police Department's capital budget to NYCHA to expand broadband and to community centers. These investments were, you know, it was a lot said in the media and, um, you know, our residents were really looking forward to figuring out how that was going to be applied to the development. So, um, have you had any further conversations and discussions with the administration um, related to this new allocation of funding? I, I can't, uh, Chair, I, um, I do not know uh, where that stands. Um, I don't know if uh, Vito or uh, uh, Anika, go ahead, Anika. And let me just read a little further, Anika, too. Um, yeah, go ahead, please. Um, so the fiscal 2021 adopted budget redirected 87 million in capital funds from the NYPD to go to do it, uh, to, to do it, to extend new internet service options to New Yorkers, 200,000 NYCHA residents. And the initiative would extend service to 84 NYCHA developments and in total, it would be 157 million in invested for broadband expansion. And, um, and then there was $22 million in directed capital funding for the renovation of three currently vacant community centers in Monroe Houses in the Bronx, Sheepshead Bay Houses in Brooklyn, and Wagner in Manhattan. And additionally, a fourth NYCHA community center located at Ocean Bay Houses in Queens. Thank you, council member. Um, I just wanna start with your first question about the broadband. Um, the broadband is a citywide project, so it is not being managed by NYCHA and that funding is not in our budget. Um, I understand that they are running an RFP process, uh, but that's as much as we know about that at this stage. Um, on the city, um, I think you mentioned the three community centers, Monroe, Sheepshed Bay, Wagner. I believe the funding allocated to each at Monroe, it's 5.7 million. Sheepshed Bay, it's 322,000. And at Wagner Houses, it's 15 million. Um, so none of these projects are in construction yet, but they are in our pipeline of projects. Okay, and what about, um, I see here, there was another 428 million, the remaining from the 537, um, directed to the Parks Department. Correct. That's the Parks Department, correct. That's not with NYCHA. Okay, but is it for? So my understanding is for that 428, it's um, to Roy Wilkins, and that's 92 million. Um, I believe there's 87 million um, for additional scope and relocation, and there's a remaining 250 million that's uncommitted, is my understanding. Okay, but so those funds are not with NYCHA. So going back to the broadband, although the funds are not with NYCHA, is do it. Um, the fact that it says service to 84 NYCHA developments, it's kind of interesting that they would actually have listed here a number of developments and not have ongoing conversations and just a communication with NYCHA because how would the city just come up with which developments should be, you know, should receive this, this initiative, if not having a conversation with NYCHA? So my understanding is that um, we've been having or have had in the past conversations with City Hall regarding the projects, um, but we can follow up and get you more specifics regards to where those projects are with NYCHA. Okay, okay. And, and uh, you know, Majority Leader, I'm not sure if you just heard that question, but clearly if we're in the middle of these budget conversations and we're talking about, you know, shifting and reallocating funding from one agency to, in particular, we're talking about NYPD and we were also just talking, Councilmember Ayala mentioned, you know, like work that's being done with NYPD and safety and security and different things. 
this will be another year and how do we not know you know what's happening with the funding so i just wanted to highlight that point um okay so going back to the rad discussion i know councilmember ayala opened up the discussion around rad but another major problem that NYCHA is pursuing um, is pursuing to in order to stabilize and improve physical conditions within the portfolio is the rental assistance demonstration or permanent affordable affordability commitment together RAD PAC program. The program aims to convert the funding stream of an estimated 62,000 units of public housing from section nine to section eight. To date, how many units have been converted under the program across how many bundles and developments and how much funding and resources have these conversions brought in to address the issues at NYCHA? So we're uh, hitting around uh, 9,500 units converted uh, uh, with this program. And uh, we were also, I think, approaching about one point Eight billion dollars in investment through through this program, um, and that's uh, uh, there's additional closings that are scheduled this year, uh, and I can't remember the number, council member. So let me see if I can. Um, we have another bundle, two more bundles of units that we want to do this year, and I think. Let me let me get you uh, specific because I I don't want to misspeak on the number of properties, but it has uh, the ninety five hundred and the one point eight are what we've got so far, plus what's coming this year. So, I'm gonna use this figure, the last figure uh, that we heard. How have the conversions decreased NYCHA's total estimated capital need, which was 31.8 billion before? So if you mentioned the 8 billion in investments, what can you just kind of talk us through what does that 8 billion in investments actually mean compared to the 31.8 billion in capital repair needs for the portfolio itself? Well, it's 1.8 billion in capital raised for those sites. So um, it, it's not eight billion; it, it's one point eight. If it, uh, I didn't, I didn't want to misspeak there, but it's one, it's one point eight billion for ninety five hundred um, uh, uh, units, and um, you know, our our uh, uh, in in thinking about the whole portfolio, we want to keep those sixty two thousand units. They um, uh, the, the blueprint covers around 25 billion, the 62,000 would cover the balance. We're looking to do about another 11,800 this year in 21. Um, so that'd be another chunk of units and another raise. I don't have the estimated capital raise for that yet, but we, we could provide that. And that includes another 35 properties so um, that is certainly going to take us over $2 billion in capital, but um, I don't have those numbers yet. And they actually won't be final till we have the closing and know how much financing we've raised uh, against that. But uh, so it will make a dent. You know, we're anticipating those 62,000 will make a dent in it. Uh, but that still leaves us with the 110 and the 25 that we need to raise there. Are there any COVID related impacts to the pace of the conversions planned for this year? Uh, I think there have been. I think we've slowed down in part. Um, I can't give you specifics as to which, but I think it has slowed us down. We actually had hoped to close one bundle last year. It didn't close and we moved it to this year. And I think a lot of that is around uh, just dealing with the logistics of trying to do things during COVID. Okay, 
In the fiscal 2021 adopted budget last year, June, the city council allocated $16.1 million in discretionary capital funding to NYCHA to fund the construction of 51 projects. In developments undergoing RAD conversions, should the city council continue to provide funding for those projects? And what is the level of coordination between NYCHA and council members in deciding what projects, if any, should be funded at RAD developments? Um, if there, uh, if you've identified what that project is for, I don't see why that can't be taken into the planning, whether it's RAD or us. Mm -hmm. So As the reason I, said I ask to, that question is because the whole point yeah. of having the RAD conversions is to be able to get the capital that is needed for the entire development with this new public-private partnership itself. Correct. And so if the city council with very limited funds are allocating funding to these developments, um, that's funding that could be allocated to developments that are not going through conversions. We don't know what's actually happening to be able to assist them. And so you would, uh, you know, I, I was under the impression that with the RAD conversions, that would be, you know, that particular conversion would address all of the capital needs. It should, and um, I think that's a council decision in a way. I mean, if if we know, if we can show you that that work is going to get done then that would free a different choice for sure. So um, I understood council decision, if it makes sense to just to not fund the project, but it would just be good to have that conversation to kind of know what you know, what's happening with the projects. Sure. Uh, um, does NYCHA have any data on the number of evictions to date that have occurred in developments that have been converted through RAD? Um, we do, and I, I uh, don't have that. It's 65, I think. Sorry. I've heard that number before, so it's the same number? Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that some of the RAD developers have actually um, forgiven all delinquencies when they've taken over the property uh, and started over with uh, residents. And there were no evictions in 2020. Uh, and out of the, uh, that's against the 65 evictions is out of 9,517 households that uh, I mentioned earlier. Okay, so going to the HUD SDNY agreement investments. The 2021 adopted plan includes about 279 million to address the main pillars of the HUD administrative agreement, which requires NYCHA to remediate living conditions in relation to lead paint hazards, mold, pest infestations, inspections, heating, and elevators. Can NYCHA provide the total amount of dollars operating and capital spent on these pillar areas since the January 2019 administrative agreement was signed? Sure, I'm going to ask uh, Anika if she could respond to that. Great, thank you for the question. Um, as the chair mentioned in his testimony, from 2018 to 2021, we increased the departmental operating budgets in the pillar areas by 121 million. In terms of actual expenditures, from January 2019 to December 2020, we spent 433 million in operating funds and 318 million in capital funds across the pillar areas. How many additional staff positions, including temporary staff, and how much overtime was paid in 2020 to complete repairs and remediation work in relation to the pillars? Sure, that's a, another great question. So as of March 11, 2021, there are 3,528 full-time staff across the pillar departments and 99 staff as part of temporary resources for the pillar departments. Um, and in terms of your question on Overtime, um, NYCHA has spent 155 million on overtime in 2020. Unfortunately, our overtime codes are not specific to pillar areas, but I can tell you that 32 million of the overtime or about 20% was spent on caretakers, 17 million was spent on plumbers, 16 million on maintenance workers, 14 million on elevator mechanics, 12 million on painters and 64 million across various other titles. Okay. 
what is the contract value of third party vendors to complete repairs and remediation work in relation to the pillars? Sure. So um, the 2020 contract budget across the pillar areas is a hundred and $38 million. 52 million is in the departmental budgets for the pillar areas and 86 million is for heating and elevator repairs at the properties. Okay. So I'm looking at the HUD SDNY um, graph that mentions the, the, the funding from 2018 versus the funding for 2021. Sure. And um, just looking at lead, for 2018, there's, it's 12 million. For 2021, there's an estimated 44 million. How um, do the total amount of investments in the pillar areas compare to the total capital need in each area? Because I'm looking at you know what was spent in 2018, I'm looking at the investments for 2021, but what's the overall? Um, for each pillar area. Great. So are you talking in terms of operating capital or everything? Um, this graph is in reference to everything. The, the, the graph that you actually provided us. Yes. Yeah, so that graph is strictly the operating funds, but we do have the capital funds for you as well. Okay, so break down the operating and then break down the capital. Sure. So um, the graph that you have in front of you is for the operating um, expenditures in 2021, and that's specifically in our operating budget. So for lead, there's 44 million, mold, 16 million, pests and waste, 36 million, elevators, 85 million, heat, 74 million. And the other pillar areas, including EHS, I'm sorry, environmental health and safety, quality assurance, and compliance, that's 21 million. All told, $277 million in operating funds for the pillar department's budgets. In terms of capital, for mold, 33 million, lead, 84 million, pests and waste, 15 million, elevators, 201 million, heat. 628 million, and in the other uh, small areas compliance, EHS and QA, there's no funding. So, all told in capital, it's 961 million allocated in 2021 for those areas. When you think about sort of your broader question, I believe, on context um, for what it would take for our entire portfolio to treat these areas, we estimate that amount to be around 28. $28.6 billion. So when you think about the $28.6 billion in capital needs and the $961 million that we're allocating for just one year, we're barely scratching the surface. Okay. Okay. Moving to Blueprint for a change. During the summer months of the COVID-19 pandemic in July 2020, NYCHA announced the Blueprint for Change plan which outlined a set of ideas and strategies to reorganize the authority and secure the capital financing required to stabilize and improve physical conditions at its 300 developments. Can you provide an update on how many residents have been engaged after the release of the plan? And can you provide some clarity on the timing of this announcement and why it was released during the pandemic? So, um... We didn't anticipate the pandemic clearly, but it's our belief that we can't wait. Uh, we understand that this is not ideal, and um, uh, we understand that we've all had to, to kind of pivot with this. And we decided to go ahead because we're talking around long lead times, even if we get, even if this, this set of ideas comes together. We have uh, trust legislation that has to be passed. We have, even if we got that, we still have to negotiate with HUD in terms of the tenant protection vouchers. Even if we got both of those things, we still actually have to do the darn thing. So um, our feeling is that we had to put something on the table to at least begin a conversation. So since that time, uh, we have met with 193 of the 206 active tenant association presidents. And this has come in a variety of ways, everything from one-on-one -on -one to small groups, 
to uh, property specific sessions. And I hope to meet with the remaining tenant associations 100% uh, in March and April. We've been doing weekly town halls with residents. Uh, since December, there have been 12, and we've touched over 2,000 attendees. We're continuing those, and we started development specific town halls. We have been meeting with the CCOP on a weekly basis. And part of those weekly meetings include a review of the blueprint, and particularly we're going line by line through the proposed legislation, responding to their concerns on perhaps uh, language and what that means. And we're also going to uh, continue or ramp up our physical outreach because we know a lot of people do not have uh, access. We've done uh, one rent insert, we're doing another, we're doing flyers, and we're going to be preparing a more detailed mailing to residents in the coming weeks. So this has been, um, since, uh, since last year, a very strong effort to share the ideas and stress that this is a path that we've identified that we believe could raise the money. Um, and from the feedback we're getting, everything from what does this part of the thing mean? What, what about my rights? How are you preserving these? We're beginning to hone in uh, on changes to the legislative language I've already mentioned and making sure that we secure the properties. One of the ideas of interest, there have been two that I thought I would share today. Um, one of them is creating a family protections contract. Uh, we put that in the materials uh, early on, but lately it's come up a number of times in the, in the small development and the town halls um, where uh, a family that lives in a property that might go through the blueprint, we would execute a contract that restates the rights and protections, uh, so forth. The other thing that's come up is uh, I don't know if I have a name for it, uh, Chair, except uh, uh, like a resident technical advisor, uh, somebody who would work with the families that might be involved uh, with us in this uh, transition and provide a, a variety of advice, anything from working with our architects and engineers to come up with, uh, say, a successful construction schedule or design to providing technical advice on uh, documents or validating uh, things. So uh, we actually had the uh, uh, resident group on Staten Island ask about that and we said we'd be very open to that. So these conversations are yielding, I think, uh, some, both the engagement level is intense, but it's also yielding some ideas that we believe we can incorporate into the program. The second key component of the plan relies on the use of tenant protection vouchers, which would require federal action and approval. How likely or how feasible is it that all um, 110,000 units would be eligible for the vouchers or um, for HUD Section 18 disposition program? So, um... In thinking about this, uh, starting in last August, we began technical conversations with HUD uh, in, in the prior administration. They've continued uh, in this administration. Um, and uh, I think the easiest way to think about this is that we'd be bundling uh, groups of properties for the blueprint. So we wouldn't be putting the demand for all 110 on the table at the same time that we'd be sequencing these and that we'd probably have groups of 10 to 12,000. And in the context of the federal appropriations, we think that's doable. Uh, that would mean that HUD and Congress would have to provide some additional vouchers each year, but they wouldn't have to provide uh, the full 110 all at once. And we could spread that out over several fiscal years that we think increases the likelihood that we could get them. Um, I will say um, HUD has, um, uh, at the technical level, this is, you know, the new secretary hasn't weighed in on any of this yet, but they, we have exchanged ideas on schedules, on numbers of vouchers, on the demand for vouchers. And I think 
what I'm hopeful for is with the new administration, uh, that actually translates into an appropriations request. But I, I don't have any indication yet, but, but they have had really uh, interesting um, uh, conversation with them on how long this would take and how we would schedule those vouchers out. So, you know, again, when I, I opened up um, with my statement, I mentioned, um, you know, the conversations that I've had with Senator Chuck Schumer, um, our majority leader, in the U.S. Senate, and um, you know, he mentioned the fact that there, like, this second round would be um, mm. infrastructure funding um, for public housing authorities, and that you know, again, NYCHA would receive a considerable amount. Um, so, if NYCHA is to receive a considerable amount, let's say thirty billion um, in funding. Um, from the federal government in the second round, would there still be a need to have this conversation of converting 110,000 units to Section 8? So um, I think the capital would be great, uh, but we have a couple things to think about. First is um, the numbers that are being used are based on HUD's physical needs assessment. And there are certain components that are not counted in the physical needs assessment. For example, I can replace a door, but I can't create a new entryway. So one is simply fix as is, one is actually making the building a much better place. So uh, a lot's gonna depend on if we get the capital and the infrastructure, um, uh, how much it is and what they're basing that number on. And we actually are in conversations uh, you know, about that kind of thing. The second thing is the one thing about the trust uh, that we tried the to include in with, with HUD and uh, federal and our electeds as well about these numbers. So that's, and there are two bills. Um, I know that uh, Congresswoman Velasquez's bill was introduced in the Senate, but there's a second bill from Congresswoman Waters and the formulas are different. And I don't, I can't see into that, but I can tell you that uh, that'll have to be reconciled in some way and we'll just have to see how that works out. Um, but um, the second thing is the procurement. We, we, we would need, uh, uh, the model that's in the trust bill is called best value. And the reason it's called best value is we wanted to try to move away uh, from low bid and we wanted to try to, um, incorporate into our thinking uh, things like Steve is doing now with design build, but also construct. We wanted a menu of choices. And that relief I think would still be needed however we get the money, whether we get it from Washington or we, or we leverage it. And the last piece of this is um, while the capital is certainly uh, going an enormous way, the one thing about migrating the the program is they pay more, that there's no talk of increasing the operating subsidy formula. There's no talk of, uh, of changing the formula factors. In fact, Congress hasn't done that for uh, 12 or 15 years. And the only reason I mentioned that is if you think about it, then uh, some of the numbers we shared with you in the testimony, um, that operating subsidy is subject to cuts and prorations routinely. Even in today, where we're talking about 97, 97 cents on the dollar, that does not happen on the voucher side. That the money that comes in, that additional subsidy over the long term, does have the potential to put the property in a much better financial footing um, with grant funds related to capital, even more so. Now, I'm not saying that's the only reason to make a migration like this, but there are things about it that simply providing the capital doesn't solve for. It solves for a lot, clearly. But uh, uh, the, the voucher program doesn't get cut the way we've been cut. And, and, the, and the, it's also a, it's a, it's a more rich form of subsidy for us. You know what would be I, helpful um, just for the residents who are listening? Sure. To, to, for you to be able to... Um, simplify it a little more. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, we have tried. The unit, we, when you convert the unit um, yeah. to Section 8, how much rent is charged for that unit and how much um, will that new landlord receive um, for that particular so unit? In, in the trust model, uh, we've been using the average income produced in public housing that's rent, uh, capital share of a unit, and subsidy. That's about $1,250. If we migrate that same unit to a tenant protection voucher that's attached to the apartment, it generates $1,900 in income, $650 per unit per month more. So we actually show the, the, the resident that. And in addition, in the trust model, NYCHA, uh, the, the trust contracts back to NYCHA, so we don't have a private landlord in that model. There's no private entity at all. In fact, it's the two public agencies. So that, that additional money would come in and be there for the benefit of, uh, of the trust and um, uh, help us uh, uh, in the long run. And the rents are the same. 30% uh, of monthly adjusted income in public housing, it's the same in the voucher program. We, we spend a lot of time talking about this when we do the, um, uh, when we do the presentations and we've done the one-on-one -on -one meetings because residents ask a lot of questions about rent. So we're very clear that rent you're paying now, same formula and the additional money that comes in, this additional subsidy, that's where, that's where we unlock the, the uh, capital potential. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the reason why I wanted to just highlight that is because that's what we hear all the time. Um, you know, what's the point of converting to from section nine to section eight? Um, why don't government just give that money directly to um, the section nine program so that they can go directly to the, the PHAs, PHAs? And so, um, but it's just not, that's not the formula that currently exists. That's not how they allocate funding. And that's, that's right. Uh, now, and, and, and I think uh, there's an appetite there to do some capital grant uh, for na nationally for public housing. And we've been supporting that. I mean, we have not, um, we've worked with the public housing industry. We've sent uh, two or three letters now indicating the need to do something about the capital backlog. Um, so we're not, we're, I don't want to give the impression we're uh, diminishing this. This is really powerful if it happens. But we do think even with the capital funding we'd get, we'd have to do some kind of borrowing to supplement that at some point. Okay. All right. And um, my last set of questions is related to the property-based budgeting. Um, <laughs> NYCHA recently implemented a bottom-up property-based budgeting approach, which now allows property managers to submit requests for additional supplies, contracts, equipment, and other supplies and materials in the discretionary accounts they manage. Property managers control 20% of the property budgets for day-to-day -day expenses. The remaining 80% is managed centrally for utilities, payroll, property insurance, and other expenses. Does this property-based budgeting approach apply to all developments and did all property managers submit budget requests for 2021 and were they approved or not? Well, Thank Chair, you. we Chair, we have, to, we have our CFO here. So uh, I'm gonna let her speak to this. <laughs> Great, thank you. I am happy to report that the answer to all of your questions is yes. So yes, the property-based budgeting approach applies to all of our properties, yes, all of our property managers submitted their requests for inclusion in the 2021 budget. And yes, all of the property managers requests were approved and they're including in the materials that you see in front of you. The work that we've done um, last year in terms of putting together the budget with the property managers is a first for NYCHA. So we started in September by training our property managers and their staff to think about how they spend their funds, the accounts that they control, and just basic budget concepts. What are revenues? What are expenditures? What are surpluses? We know that our property managers come to this work with varying levels of knowledge with regard to the budget. And so we also had one-on-one -on -one sessions with them to go through their specific property budgets and the materials in great detail. 
After that, each of the property managers submitted their requests. It went up through the chain and they were ultimately approved for inclusion in the budget. So that resulted in an additional $16 million in equipment, supplies, contracts, and other small um, contract and supply budgets for our property managers. And the 16 million is on top of all the money they already receive. Thank you so much. Just for, just for clarification, um, Anika, you mentioned the we're going back to the 120 million um, with the sure with, right. Um, can you explain? Um, uh, some residents pay utility bills. Some residents pay electricity bills. Correct. So can you um, just kind of go over which developments actually have to pay for utilities, and um, and because there was. Um, funding for NYCHA uh, related to utilities? Was there any funding um, avail made available for the residents that have to pay utilities? So um, that's a great question. Um, you are correct in saying that some of our residents pay utilities. When they do, they receive a utility allowance and that utility allowance um, is published and is updated by NYCHA, generally speaking, on an annual basis. And your utility allowance can be for electricity um, or gas, um, and it's done on a monthly basis, so it's taken off from your rent. And it's really based on the number of units, I'm sorry, bedrooms in your unit. So just to give you an example, um, if you are in a one bedroom and you pay electricity, your monthly utility allowance would be $53. If you were paying um, Con Ed cooking gas, that would be $25. Um, national grid gas would be $24. And we have that schedule. And of course, as you would imagine, the dollar amounts go up as you have greater numbers of bedrooms. I could recite for you the list of developments that pay their own utilities, but it's a very long list. Um, and I'm happy to provide it to you if you'd like. Just give me an example. Um, sure. Oh, I can, <laughs> uh, sure, I can, I can name a couple. bed -Stuy, Rehab Phase One, Belmont Center, Berry Street, Boynton Ave, Bushwick 2, Campos Plaza, Claremont, Crown Heights Rehab, East 165th Street. I have the list um, in alphabetical order and I have so entries question. all so, the way down to West so, Tremont so groups. Question. Using um, Crown Heights Rehab as an example, right? Sure. So um, what you're saying is the resident will receive a utility bill, right? And they're expected to pay that utility bill. However, the cost of that utility bill is taken out of their monthly rent payment. So you, you, so they're not really paying for the utility. They are, but it's more of a reimbursement, like a reimbursement. So yeah, yes and no. Um, I, I don't want to mislead you. So I, I can't say for certain that, you know, Jane Smith in, um, Crown Heights, who gets a utility bill for her electricity for $60 in her one bedroom apartment, is going to receive $60 from NYCHA. Um, she's going to receive the $53 electricity utility allowance um, as provided in the schedule for a one bedroom apartment. So it might not be one for one, and we can perhaps do some analysis um, to see where the charges might differ, but it's a little difficult because I don't have residents' utility bills to know the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm bringing it out is, you know, because clearly if NYCHA is being reimbursed, right, or if NYCHA is able to receive uh, um, funding resources from the federal government because of COVID related to utilities, and then we know that residents are in their homes for an extended period of time now because it's COVID, did, was there an adjustment made to, um, you know, what their monthly rent would be to reflect that particular, um, you know, new, like a, a added increase because of COVID. So what I would say to that is NYCHA already outside of COVID, um, our utility expenses when we're talking about the formula are included. So it's your project expense, everything that it takes for NYCHA to run the building. Um, and that includes our expenses as an authority, utilities and the like. So it's not something new, so to speak, or that is different from how HUD would normally do things. And for the residents um, that pay their own utilities, they already receive that utility allowance. Um, and if you're a resident who is 
not paying your utilities and NYCHA pays them for you, there's no difference to you, if that makes sense. I'm looking at my chief of staff like, does that make sense to us? <laughs> so, okay, so let's like take a step back. If you're Jane Doe and you were in Crown Heights um, and you pay your utilities, you get your bill, NYCHA reimburses you based on the schedule. We have rules that we have to follow in terms of reasonable, yeah, cons reasonable consumption by HUD. So we can't make it $100, even though we'd love to. Um, so we are really bound by that to treat all of our residents fairly based on the number of bedrooms. So if you are Jane Doe and your bill is $100 for your one bedroom, but Kathy Smith's bill is $150, we can't really make that adjustment. Um, we have to use the reasonable consumption basis that HUD requires of us. So that's how that would work. You would get your $53 um, utility allowance off of your bill, off of your rent. If you are an, a NYCHA resident who does not pay your utilities and NYCHA pays them for you, um, you don't see any change, regardless of if we use CARES Act money to pay our utility bills or if we use our regular federal operating funds to pay the utility bills, there's no difference to you. The lights are still coming on and the bills are still being paid from their perspective. Okay, the reason why I'm, I'm still a little confused is because I was talking about COVID specific, you know, related expenses. And again, we know that the expenses increased because of COVID in the units that have to pay. Uh, and because, and, but, it, but the formula is the same pre, right. from pre-COVID time. Yes. So my question is related to that. So uh, to Anika's point, HUD says, this is how you calculate a reasonable utility allowance. And that has not changed as part of the formula funding at, that goes into the subsidy we get. Because when we apply those utility allowances, HUD, HUD is measuring that in the subsidy calculation. Um, and uh, that's why they're adjusted annually, but they have not been adjusted uh, uh, or we've not received any guidance from HUD on adjusting them for COVID. Correct, but Greg, we could take a proactive look to we look could, at our utility we could do consumption that. I and mean, see what's uh, appropriate. Uh, yeah, we, I, I think we would certainly be permitted to do that. In fact, um, we have a lot of issues with HUD when they calculate the operating subsidy formula because they're making choices. There, there's factors, Chair, that they use um, that apply across the country. Then some of them break down when you come to our market. And, you know, we've pointed this out to them uh, to, to, to do that. But... Um, We'd be glad to take a look at that to see if there's any room for doing something like that. Well, I'm just trying to also figure out. So going back to that 120 million, right? Yeah. Yeah. Utilities. Right. Go ahead. Putting that in context to what we're talking about, right? So uh, I'm going to try this, Anika. You you come up behind Please. me if I mess it up. So uh, the um, that money came to NYCHA for expenses but that would not impact the utility allowance that the family gets. It would help us cover a cost, there's no question, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna come around and, and impact that individual family with their utility allowance. That's, that's, not, that's not how it came to us. It really just came to us to cover like an operating cost for protective gear. They're not, they're not connected in the way we got the money. Okay, now we're just trying to figure out if they could be connected. I was trying to figure out if there was a way to be able to provide additional subsidy to residents of NYCHA who have to pay utilities. Sure. Had to pay mm -hmm. an increase in the utilities because of their, you know, now being home um, all day as opposed to- Right. You know, yes, right. We, yes and, we can commit to looking at our utility allowance schedule again and making updates. We can commit to that. Okay. All right, um, so that for me, just want to double check. Yep, so and I'm going back and forth because my phone died, yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. Another question. Um,
In regards to your uh, work order backlog, how are you managing your work order repairs during COVID? Um, I'm going to uh, ask the general manager to, to give us a, a, a quick COVID work order uh, update. Sure. <clears throat> so we, so we um, never stopped um, making repairs uh, throughout even the height of the pandemic. We, we were adjusting um, as we were getting information from, again, the healthcare experts um, as to um, it, how long we should be in apartments for, uh, but we never stopped addressing uh, immediately hazardous conditions such as water leaks, um, lead-based paint hazards or mold conditions. Um, so we always had staff that were responding to that, uh, but we were mindful of the fact that both staff as well as residents have ser serious concerns and reservations uh, about people working in their apartments. Um, we have continued to monitor uh, the guidelines that are being issued on a daily basis. We've adjusted our work order guidance accordingly. And we started to open up uh, the types of work orders um, using severity codes as a guide. Um, so we're being more inclusive. Are we back to where we were pre-COVID? No, we're not, we're not there yet. Right, but we're certainly are working towards that goal. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, Audrey, I'm actually, I've completed my questions for NYCHA. So thank you. That, was, that is it for the questions I have for NYCHA. Um, you know, clearly we have a lot of follow-up. Um, but thank you so much. And um, you know, you'll stick around to hear from the residents and the public. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, we will now turn to testimony from the members of the public. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Once your name is called, a member of a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and announce that you may begin. Your testimony will be set to two minutes. I would now like to welcome Vernice Tillery to testify, followed by Layman Lee. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Am I being yeah. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak before the esteemed city council members and Chairman Russ. My name is uh, Bernice Tillery, and I um, am a parent of a 15-year-old in a wheelchair, and we live in Wise Rehab, LLC, and this, we've lived here for all of his life, 15 years. But this building does not, it's not wheelchair accessible. Uh, so that's what my question is. And we live in Manhattan in District 6, Helen Rosenthal's district. So I'd like to speak about the lack of accessibility for my son and the our other seniors in the building that could benefit from a ramp as well. So Chairman Ross, I see in the um, final PHA for 2021, no funding for WASE Rehab. And I've spoken on countless occasions to many managers, we've had a few in the last four or five years about the need and the feasibility of a ramp to this building. I've even made attempts to get funding from the city council person, from the Manhattan Borough president, so that a ramp of some sort, temporary or permanent, could be added to this building. And I'd like to know if you could address this problem because it affects our quality of life. It also affects um, expired. himself in the world.
Okay, Ms. Tillery, so what, you know, what I would like to do as chair of the committee is um, have a follow-up meeting with you, um, the leaders in your development, as well as NYCHA and the electeds um, immediately so we can discuss what's happening. Certainly, I would appreciate that. As long as we make some kind of forward motion because getting in and out of this building is becoming more and more difficult as he gets older and heavier. So thank you so much okay, for the I'm opportunity. I'm sorry. I'll make sure that my staff follow up with you and in NYCHA and your elected officials. Thank you. Okay. And um, before we go to, to Layman, um, I just wanna point out that we have other NYCHA residents that are here. I know I see Lakeisha Taylor. I know I see Sandra Coleman. I, and so I wanted just to make sure that we are hearing from our residents first. I'm not sure of the order, um, Audrey, but I just wanted to highlight that. Yes, thanks very much, Chair. We will now hear from Sandra Coleman, followed by Lakeisha Taylor. Time starts now. Okay, um, greetings all. Um, my name is Sandra I. Coleman. I am a current resident of Isaac Houses and a former municipality employee. I supervise payroll for the NYPD. I am also the co-founder of the Holmes Isaacs Coalition. The conditions in NYCHA are just horrific. There are massive environmental issues that are making residents sick and are not being remediated. Mold, mildew, infestation, lack of repairs and crumbling infrastructure must be addressed now. The city's public housing authority has an obligation to preserve our homes and not to pass on their responsibility to privatization schemes. The city, state and federal government must invest immediately into our homes. Stakeholders of public housing has seen the decline over the years and it has exacerbated when the white flight took place decades ago. There is a great number of blacks and Hispanics that call NYCHA home. The disinvestment is systemic. The lack of care is systemic. The patchwork repairs are systemic. The lack of heat and hot water is systemic. The inoperable elevators, especially the newer ones, is systemic. The infestation that residents are subjected to live with is systemic. Our babies being poisoned with lead poisoning is systemic. My friend in Forest Houses has resided in two apartments contaminated with lead. There is no accountability nor prosecutions being brought forth. When these type of failures and neglect arises, the cloak of immunity allows this willful neglect to continue. I am asking the city council to work closely with stakeholders, not just resident council presidents, but also residents like myself, so we can receive relief from our hazardous living situations, as well as hold those accountable for settings that we are living in, which is not our will. This is not a third world country, although our developments appear that we reside in one. NYCHA is slowly killing residents and or has stricken them with chronic upper respiratory Time conditions. I'm almost criminally has, crim criminality has to be held accountable. These circumstances are not new. They are chronic, systemic, and has gone forth administration after administration. I urge that, the, uh, that a commission is formed and find the fault as well as the mismanagement of funding. NYCHA, residents of NYCHA deserve renovatements for the suffering that they have endured over the years. Lastly, abolish qualified immunity. We the people must see better governance and humane living conditions for every public housing tenant. Thank you for hearing my testimony. Thank you. We will now hear from Lakeisha Taylor followed by Damian Samuels. Time starts now. Okay. Hi, my name is Lakeisha Taylor. I am speaking today as a co-founder of the Homes Isaac Coalition. The HIC uh, Coalition was found to combat the public housing crisis that has plagued all of NYCHA campuses and to fight for adequate funding and timely repairs for all of NYCHA residents. Thank you for listening to my testimony today. My main point is, to, um, is a cautionary tale 
to, uh, to committee members. If the city decides to give money to NYCHA, then NYCHA needs to be a good steward of such funds. NYCHA has not been a good steward in the, in the recent past and pre present, which is why I am asking, why is NYCHA seeking funding to repair a six year old elevator? NYCHA previously received money from the city government to buy, buy 10 elevators, yet their maintenance schedule is so poor that the disrepair to, six, to a six year old elevator is far beyond what should be. As we know, living in NYCHA is not easy. We here at Holmes Towers thought it was going to be um, great, I'm um, sorry, is going to get better, at, get easier five years ago when we finally got brand new out of the box like Christmas present elevators. Unfortunately, the new elevators uh, have brought more than nothing but the same, just worse. During the two year co um, construction, I lost my job because of the, of the consistent outages of the elevators. I am also sharing uh, my living experience because of the repeated elevator failures. It was torture walking up 25 flights with a toddler and all the belongings that, that come with having a toddler. Three years later, the new elevators Time have not fine. made have not made the situation any better. Sorry, I'm gonna have to go on. We barely go, um, go a week without, um, without one breaking down. Even NYCHA's own repair report shows how it includes all of the outages that have happened. So um, they show that our elevators break down five times since February. It is, I attached this report so that you can see it within my um, testimony. My toddler now sticks, thinks that he should stomp his foot to make the elevator go if it pauses for too long. Then, then let's not forget, we've actually, um, and let's not even forget if we actually get stuck. The times when the elevator doors have not closed fast enough, or even if we, um, the elevators are unleveled on floors. How about when the elevators just skip a floor altogether. The, figure, the physical disrepair shows the lack of respect NYCHA has for, for its residents. There is, there is hardly any notifications beforehand when the elevators are being um, our planned maintenance work to get done. This makes residents late for works or appointments. I would also like to point out the lack of safety in our development. The doors are constantly broken or or constantly and easily broken. There are times that the elevators have been broken for days. The intercom systems don't work. When residents talk to management, they, uh, I'm sorry, this is a mistake. Ooh. Um, they love to tell you that you are the only one that has called in. It is an excuse after excuse after excuse, much like what I've heard here when with Mr. Rust. I'm sorry, I've been hearing the same thing for years and it is unacceptable. With COVID, people are stuck in their homes and now there are homeless people outside your doors roaming the halls or sleeping in your stairwell. NYCHA is moving for full steam ahead with this blueprint for change, with, um, blueprint for change world tour but we can't get constant extermination plan to stop roaches or rat infestation. And this doesn't feel right. I am personally, and I am personally on my third NYCHA sink and cabinet in five years, but the cabinet is, is red already breaking off. I have no, I have, I have new tiles that are on that I, that I'm sorry, that are about to fall. They don't meet the walls. They go all, um, all in different directions. And I feel like I'm on a carnival ride. This is all pop, they are already popping up and it's very unsafe. I feel like the, if I sweep, the crumbs are falling inside. So for someone who's almost disabled, this is unacceptable. NYCHA, now I realize I felt like it was me, but now I realize it is the floor. This is what is going on and we need to find a better solution. 
Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll um, one, one second, Audrey. I just want to, um, just for the record, um, Ms. Coleman's testimony was emailed, um, so we'll have that for the record. And uh, Ms. Taylor, did you did you send us your your testimony? I just want to make I sure. I believe I did. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure. And I want to. Um, okay. Thank you. Just want to make sure that I have it. I have Ms. Coleman's, but I want to make sure I have yours too, Ms. Taylor. Okay. Thanks very much. Next, we will hear from Damian Samuels, followed by Layman Lee. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Damian Samuels. I'm the Senior Director for Youth Services and Community Engagement at the Stanley Isaacs Neighborhood Center. I'm incredibly uh, pleased that you are allowed me to follow up Sandre and Lakeisha, who have, are the founders of the Homes Coalition and we work very closely with. Um, and so, uh, while we did not coordinate our presentations beforehand, I think that you will hear uh, that we have identified very similar issues. Um, and so again, thank you to Chair uh, Amper Samuel for uh, your leadership in, in, in hosting this forum. Um, I'm gonna focus uh, in my time on needs within the Isaacs Houses, Homes Towers, including repairs, uh, communication strategies for residents uh, and represent representation and solicitation of community voice. Um, and so to be blunt and, and short, um, there was a that famous, infamous article in the New York Post in 2018 that outlined, identified the Isaacs Houses Homes Towers as one of the 13 worst public housing developments in the nation. Um, as you know, uh, in 2019, residents, including those just mentioned, uh, took action uh, via a suit to force uh, NYCHA to begin to meet some of their responsibilities. And this is critically important. Uh, the mission of the Isaac Center is to promote reliance and self-dignity and it is really hard to have self-dignity when you feel like you're not able to uh, have a clean and safe home to come home to. The very basics that all of us would require of our landlord, but somehow uh, NYCHA, again, is not being able to, to meet the mark. Um, our development, as you heard, there are busted elevators constantly, there are broken heat and water systems, there are rat infestations, and often the challenge of getting NYCHA uh, staff to respond immediately is, is uh, uh, pretty arduous. And so one of the things that we are calling for today is the establishment of community liaisons. These would be NYCHA residents hired to help us to resolve some of these issues to work with TAs. Um, this, as we know, there are about 57 sites citywide. Um, and so we believe a $5 million expenditure to provide for two community liaisons per site would go a long way in helping the residents have a voice. And my last point, as I know my time has expired, uh, it is critically important that residents have a voice, particularly when we're rolling out the blueprint for change, when there are infill projects that are scheduled to come on, now then more than ever, our residents need a pipeline to communicate with NYCHA leaders who are making decisions that are going to so dramatically affect their life. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Layman Lee. Time starts now. Layman, it appears you have no audio. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Amprey Samuel, esteemed council members, Majority Leader Combo, and residents of NYCHA. My name is Layman Lee, and I am the Acting Director of Neighborhood Safety Initiatives, a project of the Center for Court Innovation. We work to build resident power and address issues of safety and public housing in some of New York's most historically under-resourced neighborhoods. Funding for neighborhoods that under MAP, for which Neighborhood Safety Initiatives is a key implementation partner, is due to sunset in June 2022. We hope for the Council to support the continuation of these services to the communities we serve in public housing. Last year, the global pandemic highlighted the stark racial inequities in our cities. It is worth noting that 14 out of 15 MAP developments are designated as being on the hardest hit neighborhoods list. Because Neighborhood SAP brings together residents living in public housing who are invested in their communities and are neighborhood connectors, the Neighborhood SAP resident teams were crucial in developing an emergency response and mutual aid relief that was launched within a month of the governor's announcement to pause. We launched a widely accessible needs assessment a resident-led essential goods delivery service, a referral system connecting residents to agency and local supports, 
and a virtual community resiliency training series that was and continues to be available to all NYCHA residents. From April to June of 2020, the needs assessment allowed us to understand the needs of NYCHA residents through 11,400 unique surveys conducted across 17 developments across the city. Through mobilization of the neighborhood SAT resident teams and creating mutual aid networks, approximately 10,000 COVID relief packages included food, drinking water, PPE, personal hygiene products, and cleaning supplies and other essential goods were delivered to 7,000 households or approximately 45,000 NYCHA residents in three months. In short, neighborhood SAT and NS neighborhood safety initiatives worked with residents to support new approaches and create opportunities to realize ideas for community safety and well-being. The center asks the council to urge the administration to fully fund and baseline the neighborhood SAT program within the mayor's action plan to ensure the important, that this important program continues. We thank the council for its continued partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you. This concludes the public testimony. If we have inadvertently missed anyone that has registered to testify today and has yet to be called, please use the Zoom raise hand function now and you will be called uh, to testify now. Seeing no hands raised, I will now turn it back over to Chair Ampri Samuel for closing remarks. Thank you so much. Um, so I wanna just, so first thank you everyone for your testimony today. Thank you so much um, to the NYCHA team for coming in and providing us with the information. We clearly know um, that there's so much that we need to advocate for and demand um, on behalf of our residents. Um, the, the striking number, the alarming number of the rent collection um, drop rate right now is concerning. And is, you know, we really do have to figure out what do we do moving forward. And so um, I'm just calling on our city government, our state government, and our federal government to all step in and, and really work with the residents on figuring out a way to provide the resources that we truly need. But at the same time, um, making sure that NYCHA, that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing as far as managing um, the funding that is received and how you prioritize the, um, the projects and the funding that you receive. Um, with that being said, I also want to um, remind everyone that I want to follow up with Ms. Um, Tillery from Wise Tower um, after this. And um, I also want to just briefly recognize, I did receive text messages from other resident leaders. Lafayette Gardens sent me a notice during our hearing that I was not able to see, but um, Lafayette Gardens is questioning the $250,000 that was received for safety renovations um, and to the playgrounds that um, NYCHA was not able to claim the funds. And there's a question about whether that funding um, is still available. Um, so I wanna have follow-up from Lafayette Gardens related to that comment. Um, also from Ingersoll. Uh, Ingersoll has been without a property manager for the past month since February 20th and they have limited NYCHA staff and repairs continue to be an issue. And um, I know you mentioned the property management budgets that was sent out. And so if there's a property manager that is not at Ingersoll and a, um, a need for more staffing there, um, I would like to have a follow-up related to what's happening at Ingersoll. And lastly, um, Atlantic Towers, I received notice from Atlantic, I mean, Atlantic Terminal, um, mirroring the same concerns that Lakeisha Taylor mentioned around the elevators and so and the funding needed for elevators and elevator repairs. Um, so Lafayette Gardens, Ingersoll, and Atlantic Terminal. And with that being said, okay, so that will conclude our uh, preliminary budget hearing on public housing for Friday, March 12, 2001. And I thank everyone for being here today. And this hearing is now adjourned. And thank you. <laughs> thank you to uh, Sarah from Finance Division. 